My name is Mike Jeremy, and I'm Investor Relations Officer for Globo. Welcome to our Capital Markets Day, our first day of this type. Thank you very much for coming along. It's my job, apart from anything, to keep things moving smoothly towards 5 o'clock, so that anything else you might want to watch this evening, you won't miss. But apart from that, I'm going to introduce you to the... I mean, what might that have been? Uh, we'll see. Um, my, my first job is to introduce you to the speakers and to the agenda for the afternoon. So first of all, our chairman, Barry Arico, uh, will make uh, comments on our performance to date and uh, on our outlook. And that will be followed uh, by our CEO and founder, Kostis Papadimitrikoulos, who will give us an outlook <coughs> on global strategy, strategy and uh, our, uh, our performance henceforth. We're delighted to welcome from Boston uh, Stacy Crook, uh, who's the research director in the mobile enterprise segment uh, at uh, IDC. And Stacy will be talking to us about the market in which we operate. Uh, that will bring us up to a break uh, mid-afternoon. After which, uh, Dimitris Gopares, our finance director, will take us through uh, the financial performance of the past year and uh, some explanatory information. Pat Costello, who's VP for Sales Western Europe, for ourselves, we'll uh, then host a panel discussion involving three of our clients who've come from far afield. It's worth mentioning that today we brought people together from throughout the organization, from worldwide. And that means not least uh, from Boston, but also from Australia as well. Rounding up at, six, at 16.30, 4.30, all being well, Mital Parekh, who's the senior director from uh, our U.S. operation, will be talking about our our uh, strategic growth um, uh, product uh, lineup, the way we're actually going to deliver on all the things that we've, uh, we'll be telling you about uh, through the course of the afternoon. That will take us to conclusion and wrap-up comments, again, from Barry at 5 o'clock. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Barry Arico. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to address the very first Globo Capital Markets meeting, um, especially after such a strong year for the company. Uh, it's a strong year in terms of our overall performance. It was a strong year in terms of recognition we've received uh, amongst and ahead of our peers, and a strong year in terms of a continued realization of the company's strategy. Um, I'd like to highlight in particular a couple of key achievements. One is the achievement of top-line revenue growth of 55% for the year ended 2013, combined with a second consecutive year of positive operating free, ca free cash flow generation, and the establishment of a new base in North America with the acquisition in early October of 2013 of the assets and personnel of Notify Technology uh, not least as a w at a well-negotiated price of $5.2 million by Costas. Um, following this acquisition, we had a successful equity fundraise of some 27 million euros in which we were backed, thank you, by our core shareholders, having outlined our strategy for expansion, principally in the U.S., involving a buildup of increased direct sales, and the development of a new mobile business services division, and a plan for other selective acquisitions. Now, this equity raise was augmented through the arrangement of debt facilities for continued expansion of about 45 million euros made available by Barclays Bank and East West Bank. As part of our U.S. buildup, it is important to mention that Costas and his family will become neighbors of mine, not particularly that it's important that they're neighbors of mine, but that they're moving to the West Coast and will be relocating shortly to Palo Alto, California, which further underlines Globo's commitment to maximizing the huge opportunity represented by the U.S. market. With an eye towards maximizing shareholder value, we are aware that our three of one of our three major peers, Mobile Iron, recently conducted its IPO on NASDAQ and usefully adding a benchmark valuation for us. We expect the pattern of capital activity in our market to continue 
reflecting a gathering pace of demand for bring your own device services. I'd like to note that Globo remains fully aware of all the capital market tools and the opportunities available to continue to develop our business. Overall, it is clear that our market has developed at high speed since 2013 in terms of definition, in terms of corporate activity, and most of all, in terms of our response to the demand. Uh, we believe that Globo is now in a strong position because of its products, because of its strategy, and because of the capital availability that we have to take full advantage at what has presented itself to be a very huge opportunity. And now to tell you more about our future and our strategies, our CEO, Costas. Costas. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, everybody, for coming today to our first Capital Markets Day. It's a great pleasure for me and all our colleagues to have you here. And I think the room is going to get more busy. Uh, hopefully, you will uh, you will have a you know, to, to bear with us for three hours. Uh, we have a very interesting panel uh, of uh, speakers uh, that will take you into the whole story. Uh, but um, I want to tell you about uh, Globo and uh, how we have, we have come here and what's our strategy. So without uh, losing time, um, I will start with, with our mission. And um, I know that our mission throughout the years since we floated has started, has changed many times. And that's okay, because the whole technology changed. So um, if, if we stood still, we wouldn't be here today. So in very simple words, we just help enterprises go mobile. And this is a very, very bold statement because it, it has many different components inside um, uh, uh, the, the product and the offerings and the services that we provide. How we do that? We have three very simple steps. We are securing devices, data, and applications. So we provide the underlying security that each and every enterprise is looking for. Secondly, we're helping app developers enter into the mobile first era. We're giving them tools that are very easy to operate with. They're totally integrated with a security platform. And this is a very, very seamless process for them building applications that they can work and be managed in all different devices that they, that they have. And last but not least, we are providing end-to-end -end project services to our customers. Consulting services, expert uh, knowledge, also professional services were needed. Now, I will just stop here and uh, ask the audience a question. I actually have a, a present for you. It's actually a World Cup set of headphones. So the first one who will answer my question will get one. So be fast, as long as you know what the question is. But uh, the ones who are already, uh, they know the answer and it's on the audience, you know, they shouldn't raise their hands. Or I'll be angry. So, does anyone know who this guy is? Come on. You can do better than that. I'll keep that for me. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll keep it. Don't worry. <laughs> or maybe I'll find another opportunity throughout the course of the speech and give it to somebody. But anyway, this guy is why we're here today. This guy is called Martin Cooper. He's an inventor of the mobile phone. And that was the head of research of Motorola back in 1973 when he actually gave his first call from the Motorola phone to their competitor, which was from the Bell Labs, Joel Engel, to say to him that you lost. Motorola brought the first mobile phone. And since then, the evolution of this industry has been so massive that even analysts like IDC and others, I think that you know, they're actually overrun in terms of projections every time because the market is moving in a very, very fast pace, even faster than they can even predict. Because 
I think that the network effect that mobility puts in people and, uh, and the engagement of having your device next, next to you all the time has such a strong engagement and, and uh, business models and application trends are, are just exploding. So since then, we have seen different devices coming into our hands from the gray devices, the gray screen devices, up to the more colorful ones, the Symbian and the Java, where we still be today selling products to, like the Citroen Go and Go Social products in emerging markets, that we still take advantage. And then, since the early 2000s, things have changed dramatically. 2006, the dominant player in the market, and the, the equivalent word to smartphone was, was RIM, BlackBerry. But since then, the, the, the entrance of uh, Apple devices, Android devices, and recently Windows devices are just transforming this whole thing. But even more, it's not about the devices. It's about the power that those devices bring to the users and the trends that those users create into their workspace. So bringing all these devices into work creates this huge tsunami of bring your own device, BYOD trend, which actually we're experiencing today. So our journey is a bit similar like this one. You know, we started back in 2007 uh, just from a kind of garage business, okay? Sorry? 1997, sorry. Ten years after, so I'm taking out, you know, ten years of uh, very uh, Greek growth. Ten years after that, we got listed on London Stock Exchange. And uh, that was a very, very difficult time for a Greek company or even a UK company to list uh, on a market. We actually listed just when the crisis has hit, you know, the global markets. And uh, uh, we, we were successful in one end, but we were also challenged because we didn't have the resources to, to pursue the whole thing. So we had to reinvent ourselves and we had to think of the bigger picture. Now, very wisely, we have read a report back then speaking about a mega trend of the future. And the mega trend was called ubiquitous computing. Back then, we were a software as a service company. And very wisely, the analyst has put a, a formula saying that ubiquitous computing equals software as a service plus mobile internet. And that was a, a revelation. You know, we knew that we were software as a service, and the only miss, thing missing was mobile internet. So we started inventing there. But because we didn't have the knowledge of mobile business, we acquired the company one year later, just, just a few months later, Rich Further Communications, which actually gave us a lot of insight and understanding about how the mobility business works. Now, one year later, 2009, we launched our, Go, our Citroen Go business, and we succeeded our first contract in Indonesia. And a year later, we launched Go Social which is actually um, a, a brother application to Citron Go. Both applications today still grow, and they produce revenues in emerging markets by serving more than 6.5 million users on a, daily base, on, on a monthly basis. Now, it's very interesting because by 2010, um, the contributions from Citron Go revenues is already start to appear here with a blue uh, line. This blue segment is actually the continued operations that today um, uh, Globo has, which is the mobility business. A year later, we entered the enterprise mobility space by launching Go Enterprise. And slowly and progressively, the, the revenues there started to grow. And in 2012, we actually divested from Global Technologies and acquired Dial... Uh, sorry, oh, sorry about that. We acquired... Um, uh, dialect, yes, yeah, so, correct. And a year later, we acquired Notify Technologies. And that was a major step for Globo because it gave us a very solid um, position within Silicon Valley and obviously made us um, well known to our peers. At the same time, our revenues grew and they're still growing. And last year, we had uh, a significant growth and obviously not legacy business revenue anymore. And by 2014, um, uh, we, think, we see things happening. 
I don't know if, you're, uh, if you had the chance to, to read uh, our uh, RNS today. Uh, we put out an RNS about our current trading, which is very, very strong, um, profitable, and it's growing. Uh, we also announced a significant project win that uh, we had with uh, our partner, Mobilize IT in Australia. Uh, it's a multi-year product uh, project, and uh, we're very proud of that. And Mobilize IT is today with us. They flew from Australia to speak to you, so we thank them very much together with all the other um, customers of us. So this is, this is our own path, and I think it's, it's quite important for you to understand what we have been through to come here. Not because we have been through all this, and some of you have supported us in, in all this journey, but it's mostly to demonstrate our ability to grow and to deliver value to our shareholders going forward. So let's see what's the opportunity there in the price mobility space. Now, this, this data comes out from IDC, and they're talking about the EMM and the MADP market. Uh, EMM market is about enterprise mobility management, so it's all, all about security of, of uh, devices, of data, of, um, of applications. And on top of that, the mobile application development platforms is all about uh, building applications, providing uh, platforms that can create applications that run on different devices. So the combined business that Globo is addressing is um, totaling at uh, more than $7 billion by 2017 as of IDC. It's driven by a rise in smart devices, mostly coming from U.S. and Western Europe. Uh, and obviously, there is an overall increase in mobile devices from seven billion to ten billion. Now, you have to you have to remember that we're speaking here about mobile devices, but the connected devices to the internet in a few years from now will be much bigger number than this one. And obviously, EMM and MADP will transform into a totally new industry because everything will be connected to the internet. So effectively, we need to manage your car, your air conditioning, your refrigerator, or whatever it's there that is connected to the Internet. And this is a new buzzword, IoT, Internet of Things, that is coming into our lives. And you will see it you know, from your consumer products coming to your hands year by year how all this thing uh, will evolve. And obviously, our presence into this market will tap into this opportunity as well. Now, our strategy is to meet our customers' needs on their enterprise mobility uh, projects worldwide. So what we're doing to address that is we have an integrated enterprise mobility solution offering. We are a scalable global platform. And third, we have a dynamic product and market development in place. So let's see each and every one um, uh, of these areas. On the integrated enterprise mobility solutions, we are doing significant work by having a very comprehensive uh, offering in terms of applications. Now, let's, let's, let's see how we started in all this thing. If you remember, we got into uh, mobility from the early days of Citron Go. And Citron Go was actually the profit of the containerization business. When we actually launched Citron Go back in 2009, we were probably the only one who has actually seen the opportunity of containerization. And why was that? Because it was, it was a mandatory uh, decision that we had to take. Feature phones are very, very, um, uh, they're not powerful. They don't have enough memory. They don't have a big screen. They don't have enough uh, capacity, CPU. So we had to move a lot of the functionality onto the cloud and the application which is downloaded on the phone is a very simple lightweight application that actually contains all, all, all the, the, right, the right data which are rendering information that comes from the powerful cloud. Now, just envision, just envision the transformation of this early stage container business to this today container business which is much more um, powerful. We had a simple container 
speaking with the cloud, connecting to your Facebook and email accounts. Today, Go Enterprise has transformed into a much more powerful container. We have a very powerful container speaking to our Go Enterprise server, connecting to any backend system. This is how we actually came with our first product, which was the Go Enterprise server, and that was the container solution. You will see later on on my slides that uh, Gartner, for the first time, um, addressed this containerization area last year. Actually, five years since we started tapping into this market. Now, because we wanted to have a cross-platform support, we developed containers for each and every operating system. At the same time, we developed a studio, a development environment that people can develop applications that run into this container. So we had the Go Enterprise server, which we didn't really know. It was, one, it was two products in one name. So suddenly, when we started selling it, we realized that people were up to both things. They really liked the container and the included functionality of email, content management, PIM, and whatever. But they also really liked the application development part. And then it became evident that we have developed something which was much bigger than the thing that we have envisaged, envisaged at the beginning. But then we came across with challenges about security and about practices that many of our competitors have put in the market. And all the EMM market has actually evolved from the mobile device management um, era. So all our competitors today, they come, they actually started from an MDM perspective. And maybe few actually came from the containerization business. So what did we do? We had, we had two choices. We will either abandon MDM or embrace MDM. So the choice was to embrace MDM. And then we had two choices. We will either develop it and lose you know, one or two years to come to at least you know, a, um, a, an acceptable uh, mode or acquire the technology. So we acquired uh, uh, the technology through the acquisition of Notify. And this brought the mobile device management thing. So today, the mobile device management and the container-based solution actually addresses all the EMM market. According to IDC, this is projected to go up to $2.1 billion of revenues for 2017. Now, at the same time, by changing the name and actually uh, the whole offering of our mobility studio and development capabilities uh, with the name of Go Up Zone, we entered into the MADP market, which is even bigger than the EMM, $4.8 billion. Now, uh, obviously, I'm referring to analysts like IDC and Gartner, and we value their uh, opinion because they guide you know, us, they guide the market, they guide our customers on how to choose things. And I will refer to them more and more, not because they drive what we're doing. They are actually validating what we're doing, and we know exactly what the challenges are because we are speaking with the customers every day. So it's very, very important to have this, this slide in your mind because this is the thing that makes us unique. This is the thing that makes Globo one of the few players globally who can address both needs into one company. Now, things are not that easy. And companies, they don't just need products. Companies, they need solutions. And to come into a solution you need to have services which are there. So let's see, again, according to Gardner's, and Stacey, I, I stole that from your slide, uh, that mobility is complex. The major uh, issues are security and development and deployment of mobile applications. Now, the key issues here, apart from security, is linking that platforms to the existing databases and existing systems on the back end. So you can actually take advantage of existing uh, investments that any company has done. Secondly, all this process takes a lot of time. It's a long development cycle. So it's not easy to, to move forward. Obviously, through this process, there are costs overrun and delays. 
and budget issues. Then again, through the course of the development, the whole scope changes, and this brings even more delays and even more bu budget overruns. And last but not least, the lack of vendors' end-to-end -end knowledge is a very, very big challenge for all customers who are um, deciding to go ahead with a mobility project. So the need for services is there, and we are tapping into the market uh, driven by intense customer and partners' demand by providing, uh, through our mobility business solution, our MBS division, which is our consulting arm, we're providing three main things. Expert consulting with dedicated teams that know everything about mobility, they know everything about project management, and they are able to guide the customer even before they start the project to where they want to go. Secondly, deliver end-to-end -end mobility solution, which means that we can connect almost any kind of system, well-known systems that are behind the, the firewall, an SAP platform, which you will see that we connected successfully for TUI, uh, or other systems, Microsoft, Oracle. These are all systems that uh, enterprises have invested. So connecting back-end system and providing end-to-end -end solutions is very, very important. And last, providing professional services. So whether our partners or the, the customer has internal development skills, we can also provide our own people to develop apps. And this is very, very important. So the benefit um, is, is very important. Obviously, there is a benefit for the customer, but there is a huge benefit for global as well. So it accelerates the client engagement because we can actually um, um, uh, help, help the customer to, to do things faster. Uh, obviously, the learning curve is also accelerated. Secondly, we are supporting through this MBS division our partners. And our partners is our scalable model to go out and speak to more and more customers into different regions of the world. At the same time, it deepens our client relationships and it produces um, re repetitive um, project revenues. But last but not least, it creates recurring revenues from licenses. And why is this? Obviously, when we enter into a project, um, the customer would like, you know, would like to have A to Z project, but to get there, you need our platform, you need to develop the apps, and you also need the consulting services. This is all a nice package for us. What we take there is the project revenues, which are about the services, but then we also get license revenues. And the license revenues, because of our revenue model, are recurring revenues. So we are using the mobility business solution department as an opener of the market, as an enabler to sell more and more licenses, which as they accumulate, they produce a very strong result for global. Now, our globally scalable platform, it's very important to understand that to get where we want to get, it's not just about products, it's not about our offering, it's also our ability to execute on a global scale. So we have a proven scalability. You know, we don't need to, to prove anything more. We have 6.5 million customers served every month through our Citroen Go and Go social platforms. We have thousands of enterprises been using the Go Enterprise Server for their internal operations. And then we have our MBS uh, department, which has executed projects in more than 15 countries. So, you know, it's scalable already. It's, it's shown. We don't need to prove anything more. But we are not stopping there. Obviously, we're amplifying our resources in each and every line of business. But even more, we are building new solutions which are scalable by nature. So one of the most scalable by nature solutions are our cloud offerings. So you will see during the year and next year more and more cloud offerings of global coming into customers' hands because this enables to, to go out faster to the customer without significant investments from the customer side and also to create, um, uh, to create revenues which are much, much better in terms of financial terms. 
So at the same time, in order to be globally scalable, we need to do significant investments in our own operations. And the operations, you know, no one has the magic stick in order to grow from 200 employees to five or 600 employees in one year. No, nobody has the magic stick or being, you know, uh, the, you know, the Jesus that everybody will follow. It's not easy. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for any of the directors of the company. So putting the right investments in place, which are hidden within our assets and costs, is very, very important. Currently, we're operating our offices in U.S., U.K., Greece, Dubai, Cyprus, and Singapore. And these operations, although these are three, uh, five, how many? Uh, yeah, six countries, uh, we have more than 11 actual sites in place. Just in the U.S., we have three sites. So this is, this is an increasing thing. And obviously, IT infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, and controlling systems are very important so that we can manage our, our growth and we can monitor that everything runs smoothly in each and every place of the world. Secondly, we have, then we have operations and provisioning of our platforms through three data centers all over the world, uh, which are uh, outsourced. And then we have our own two data centers, which hold all our information and all our IPR, so there is not exposed to any potential intruders. We have a distributed product development, deployment, um, and support, sorry, development and support through agile technologies, which is the, the best standard to develop applications in all different places of the world. Just imagine that Globo has 120 developers in two sites in Ohio and in Greece. These are developers that they develop mob, our mobile platforms. At the same time, we are outsourcing components and pieces of our technology to other people all over the world. At the same time, we already have 50 people in-house developing mobile projects, and we are outsourcing to more than 100 people all over the world, again, components from this development. So managing teams of around 300 people is not an easy thing in all these complex tasks. We have central software licensing, distribution, and update. So all our customers, they get their new versions instantly and without any service interruption. And last but not least, we have customers, distributors, and partners portals, electronic portals, that they can engage with us and they can transact with us much more efficiently so that we save time and we also um, save money. Obviously, scaling is a very big uh, question and scaling also demands markets and one of the most mature market is US. So since our acquisition of Notify last year, uh, we are amplifying our efforts into US by putting more and more um, investments into our US operations and obviously the, the first results came uh, through Q4 of 2013, um, sorry here it is uh, 2013, Q4. Um, and um, we, we think that uh, this year, uh, this operation will contribute significant revenues to, to the group. Now, the dynamic product and market development is, is, is a fact. And it's not an easy thing to handle because it changes dramatically. This is a very dynamic market. It's evolving fast in many different directions. And we need to be in position to react and to identify all challenges and opportunities there in order uh, to, to, to stay afloat. At the same time, R&D investment is, is, is our major commitment. And I'm happy that, you know, after all this journey and after so many times that we have, asked, we have been asked, what are we investing into? Now you can also see what these investments are meaning. And winning a major project in an exotic place, which is called Australia, for us Europeans, you know, is actually against, against all the competitors in the market, actually sets, you know, the mark of what our investments are about. Obviously, this creates assets, but we also have a significant cost advantage. And just remember that our competitors, out of the data, which have seen the light of uh, the sun, because both competitors, they have listed for, uh, they have filed for a Nasdaq IPO. 
we can see that they're investing 40 to 50 percent of their revenues into R&D. And they're spending almost three times more money than we are. So what does it tell you? How can we really, how can we really compete with them if we're spending three times less? There's only one way, that our manpower is three times cheaper than theirs. Otherwise, you know, it wouldn't happen. So this is a reality. Go out and check. In Silicon Valley, to have a good engineer, you will probably pay three times more than the people were paying back in Greece. And I think that this, uh, this thing is a very big um, asset that Globo has today, and we're taking advantage of it by putting more and more people coming out of Greece to, uh, to, to develop applications and projects and obviously be very, very cost efficient. But we wouldn't do it, you know, just organically. We needed to do acquisitions and target the acquisitions to build product portfolio, market reach, and technology advantage. Strategic partnerships, obviously. P partnerships with uh, large distributors, technology companies, is always something very important. And actually using our cash for acquisitions and scale of our direct sales force. Now, I show you this slide, and some of you have already seen that. But this is a slide that Gartner put out um, uh, in uh, February 2013, trying to summarize who are the key players in the enterprise mobility space. So what you see here are actually six uh, square six areas, having MDM, containers, dual personas, authentication, application wrapping, and security and testing. Now, the biggest, the biggest activity in terms of corporate transaction and obviously business-wise has been focused on those two areas. Now, let's see what has happened within the last six, 16 months in these names. First of all, Sybase was acquired by SAP, that was almost three years ago, for $5.7 billion. Secondly, Zenprise was acquired two years ago by Citrix. Fiberlink was acquired by, um, by IBM just in November 2013. Bidger Mobile was acquired again in November 20, 2013 by Oracle. Airwards acquired by VMware for $1.5 billion at the beginning of this year. Boxstone was acquired by Good Technology on April 2014, together with certain assets of Fixmo, which was again acquired by Good Technology. And then we had two files for IPO and one successful IPO already of Mobile Iron. So what does this tell you? That some of these companies have actually been... Uh, drawn out of the market and being part of larger companies. And some companies like Mobile Iron Good and Globo, of course, are going into the public way. So there are two ways to grow. You either get acquired or you grow. So we will grow. We're not going to get acquired, at least for now. And we are also part of this acquisition game. We bought Notify Technology last year a very well negotiated price for $5 million, an asset purchase agreement. Uh, I have said it many times um, that we, we could have paid three times more and we will still be happy. We did very go good bargaining there and obviously this brought significant power, including 85 persons, um, um, offices, operations, customers, <laughs> and most of all, a mobile device management that was missing our offering. Now, obviously, we have said it before that we are in an acquisitive mode and we are looking to execute acquisitions due, uh, towards um, uh, the next period. So you will listen to more about that. Now, 16 months later, and on the initial Gartner report, uh, Gartner actually put out a magic quadrant about EMM. For those who don't know what the magic quadrant is, this is, this is um, um, an approach of Gartner in identifying certain players into certain, um, uh, uh, area, uh, certain thematic areas of the technology space. So here is the uh, magic quadrant for the enterprise mobility management. 
Now, what you see here are, are four squares, four, four quadrants, and moving from, um, nor from south to north, it's actually the ability to execute. So here, the norther you go, you find companies which are uh, more well-known, they have better resources or bigger resources, um, uh, they can execute in a larger scale. And uh, this horizontal thing from east to west, uh, sorry, from west to east, you can actually uh, see the completeness of vision. Now, Globo is positioned as an East player. Obviously, we are the only new entrant into this EMM uh, Magic Quadrant. But very interestingly, we are ahead from well-known competitors like SAP and BlackBerry in terms of completeness of vision. So this validates what we're talking about in terms of our investments in our understanding of the business and how we look to, to move forward. So I think that this brings us into how we, how we see acquisitions that could actually increase this, this product offering and this product development. Obviously, we want those three items to be part of our acquisitions. We like people, we like expertise, and we like markets approach. So solid teams that they have uh, hunger for growth and at the same time they have a proven track record is a must-have component in each and every acquisition that we're targeting. Expertise, either in terms of skill or IPR, is also very important. And also markets, which are addressable either vertically, horizontally, or geographically, is a very, very important asset. And you know what? Sometimes we learn. We learn from our acquisitions. And I will give you an example. Um, you all know Alexander the Great, correct? Now, why Alexander the Great has been great enough you know, to actually grow all this empire all over the world? He didn't have this great army. He had a very small army, but he managed to conquer almost half of the world with a very small army. The reason he did that is that in each and every country that he was moving in, he was integrating into it. So he was learning from them. He was becoming part of them, and they were becoming part of his vision. And that's, way, that's how, actually, he moved forward. Now, this exact example actually shows how we learned from a recent acquisition. Our routes to market all this time and all these years have always been in direct channels. So we have always been selling through resellers and partners, which is great. It saves us money. It saves us effort. We don't need to travel that much. We don't need to have so many employees. We don't have to spend so much money. But then again, we're missing many, many things, like engagement with a customer, we are sacrificing a significant portion of our revenues because that has to go to the channel. So moving into Notify last year, we, we realized that there is also another way to address the market, which is a direct approach. And although it may create, sometimes it may create some friction between partners and partners and customers, we will always favor our partner channel in case we come into a direct sale opportunity that there's a partner sitting next to us. So there's no friction there. It's how the company wants to actually address that. So moving into Notify, we realized that direct sales economics are very interesting, although we have to sacrifice a significant part of investment in order to build sales teams, marketing, and, the whole, and scale up the operation. So this is what we did. We are now continuing our channel relationship with more than 150 distribution partners all over the world, and it's growing. Obviously, there is a pros, like lower costs and enter to the customers, cons because of the slower um, uh, customer uh, adoption, learning curve, um, sacrifice of top line revenues, but no, must, most of all, no control over the customer relationship. But moving into the direct relationship in parallel, we're actually balancing the pros and cons of the previous slide. So this is exactly 
what we want to do in terms of growing up our routes to market, but mostly how we want to integrate in each and every market that we're entering and each and every acquisition that we are executing. So our roadmap to finalize is increase our market footprint in the US and Western Europe through the EMM and MADP spaces. Develop, further develop our mobility business solution department because we think that this is the opener for our business and licensing uh, volume. Expand our direct sales and go-to-market strategy. Execute selective acquisition. And last but not least, explore value-added verticals. Now, I will just stay here for the value-added service verticals because these are, this is a very, very important area which we haven't yet even tapped into. Our platform is not, is not a product. It's a platform, which means that we can build products on top of it which can be used and sold separately. So we have done an alliance with a Greek company, Melon Technologies, which is selling uh, banking systems all over Europe. And we have built a mobile banking solution. And now this mobile banking solution is being sold to many banks throughout Europe and it's a totally different product on top of Go Enterprise technology. We aim to develop more and more products into this space or into similar spaces that can be marketed on top of the Go Enterprise technology. And this is a great thing. So this is for me. Uh, I would uh, like to call uh, Stacy Crook with us. Thank you for being here, Stacy. Uh, Stacy is a research director in IDC on the mobile enterprise um, uh, research, and she will give us some insight uh, mm -hmm. on what the market is, right? That's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Costas. So, as Costas said, I'm Stacy Crook, and I'm a research director with IDC's enterprise mobility practice. I've been with IDC about nine years now, and I have been following this space since about the 2006 timeframe. So as he laid out in his slide, there's been a lot of activity and a lot of excitement in this market. And especially the last few years, things have really started to move quickly. So it's been really exciting space to follow. So in terms of an agenda for the next 30 minutes or so, I thought we could start out with some of the high level trends that we're seeing in the mobile enterprise space. Uh, we'll move into a view of mobile enterprise markets as we see them today. And we'll wrap up with a discussion of the competitive environment as well as a view into the future. So when we think about the high level IT environment, we all know that we're in the middle of this massive structural shift from the world of PCs and client server computing to what we are calling the third platform, which is really the next generation of technology innovation. And we really believe that IT spending for the next 20 years is going to be based off of this platform and that millions of high value industry transforming solutions will be built upon the shoulders of mobile, social, big data and cloud technologies. So if we look at what's going on in the enterprise specifically today, I think we can see that consumerization has had a huge impact on enterprise mobility in a couple ways. I think there's been challenges and there's a lot of opportunities as well. So when we think about all of these personal devices being leveraged for business use, there's a lot of security challenges that we have to consider. On the flip side, there's a lot of opportunity that's offered by all these additional devices that our employees are carrying around with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So what you're looking at here is our latest worldwide business use smartphone study. And what we do on a biannual basis is we look at the entire universe of smartphones, then we break the opportunity down into consumer versus business opportunity, and then business we segment by corporate liable and employee liable. And employee liable is the BYOD opportunity. Um, so in 2012, we can see that we were already sort of past the halfway point and we believe that in 2012, 63% of all devices shipped, all smartphone devices shipped, would be leveraged for business use smartphones, would be leveraged for um, BYOD use versus corporate liable usage. 
So that's already a significant percentage. But when we look at 2017, we see that it shifted even more so, where we believe that in 2017, 80% of all business use devices shipped will be leveraged for corp uh, employee liable use versus corporate liable use. So while we already are very much entrenched in this trend, there's even going to be this the tsunami, as it was referred to, is, is just on its beginning wave and it's just going to keep growing. So the impact that this is having in the enterprise is that it's really expanded the security perimeters and it's really opened up the potential surfaces of attack. So when we think about a personal device coming into an enterprise, we have enough challenges trying to even secure our PCs that are connected to our corporate network in a reliable way. And now we're talking about personal devices that our employees own. And we're think, we have to think about the fact that consumer applications are running on these devices as well as the business applications. So I think there's a couple security concerns that, that we need to focus on to start. I think there's a lot, but just to give you a, an idea. So one of those is the fact that there's going to be consumer applications that have malicious code in them. Many of our consumer applications also are looking to um, leech data from other applications. So when you don't download an app, it will ask you for permissions to access information in other applications. That's okay if you're giving it permission and you only have consumer applications on the device. But when there's corporate applications on the device, this is a potential source of data loss. And also, if, the, uh, if there's a consumer application that has malware in it and it affects the device platform, then anything running over that same operating system could be corrupted as well. So those are a couple um, issues from that perspective. Another issue is more something that happens more proactively, where our employees are actually taking corporate information and saving this information into public cloud services. Sometimes this is referred to as the Dropbox problem. Um, but it's not just a Dropbox problem. They are also forwarding their um, corporate emails into public cloud services like Gmail. And obviously, this is corporate information. We don't want this sitting in public cloud services unless our IT department has okayed it. But the problem is IT tends to have a very large loss of visibility when we're talking about personally owned devices. So I think uh, Costas actually laid out some of these challenges. And so you can see here in terms of the numbers, one, two, three, security is a number one issue. Probably no surprise given the uh, importance of securing corporate information. Issues in linking mobile platforms to existing databases is number two. This has been a huge challenge in the mobile environment. We have seen over the years that building and deploying and integrating mobile applications uh, is not an easy task. And we'll get into why that is in the next slide. And then again, I think you know, Costas did a great job of, of explaining why. But these projects are complex, they're complicated, and there's a lot to think about. And so they often run into um, overages in terms of the time to, to deploy. So mobile application development is complex. This is sort of a fact. We've seen it over the years. It seems like it should be an easy thing because we hear about kids building iPhone applications and Android applications, but in the enterprise environment, it's not a simple thing. So one of the considerations that's been difficult is the fact that the operating system platforms are changing rapidly and the devices are changing rapidly. And it's not just Android and iOS. There are multiple different versions, especially of Android. Uh, there are multiple Android manu device manufacturers. They have their own versions. Even within those versions, there are additional versions. So the fragmentation issue is, is difficult. So in our last survey, we asked enterprises, how many operating systems do you folks plan to write to? And you can see there, the majority said two. I don't know how realistic of a view that is. <laughs> but um, you can see that only about 15% were developing for less than two. So the vast majority are developing for two or more operating systems. And my, I suspect that this is even going to grow as we get um, deeper into the future and into wearables and Internet of Things devices. So this complexity is just going to keep growing. When you think about building applications, there are different application architectures and there are different tool sets that you can use to build those applications. So an organization has to think about 
do we want to do native applications? Do we want to do HTML5 applications? Do we want to do a, uh, a hybrid application, which is essentially a web application running in a native wrapper? So what kind of application is best for our business? And there are pros and cons to each of those approaches. And then what kind of tools are you going to use to build those applications? Are you going to just use what's provided natively? Are you going to use some kind of cross-platform um, tool set to develop native applications or hybrid applications? Or are you just going to go the web route, which some companies are looking to do because it's, you know, by its nature cross-platform. Cross they have developers within the organization with this existing skill set. Um, but there are drawbacks to web applications too, such as you can't deploy them through the App Store. And HTML5 as a standard is still developing. It's come a long way from where we were a couple years ago, but it's still developing. So um, there are pros and cons to each of these approaches that have to be uh, evaluated. Are you going to do a cloud versus on-premise deployment? I think increasingly we saw, see a lot of interest in the cloud, but some companies aren't 100% ready to, to take it there yet. And we see a lot of interest in hybrid cloud, actually, where some companies might want to deploy some of this in the cloud, and they might want some on-premise. But again, another set of um, decision trees that they have to go through. Build versus buy. Um, and I think there's a number of things to consider here. Do you have the internal resources to build these applications? Do you want to outsource it to a third party? If you want to outsource it to a third party, are you going to be able to get the differentiation that you want in that application? If you're, for instance, if you're working with a digital marketing agency, are they also working with your competitor? And might you um, find that you won't be able to get the same differentiation there? So it's important to work with um, a third party that really understands the needs of your organization and isn't working with all of your competitors on the same project. Um, Backend integration is a huge challenge because of the fact that many organizations have legacy IT infrastructure that wasn't made for mobile. And even the ones that maybe have um, you know, uh, enabled an SOA type architecture, it still isn't necessarily what you need in a mobile world on its own. So having to, um, to deal with all of that is, is complexity as well. What kind of backend integration are you going to do? What kind of mobile middleware do you need? Um, finally, um, organizations have to think about what kind of applications are they delivering. So who is the end customer of these applications? And in many organizations, we see that it's a mix. They have consumer-facing applications, they have business partners that, that might need to leverage these applications, and internal employees as well. And interestingly, we have seen, because of the variety of mobile platforms that are available today, that one company will sometimes go out and be using two different platforms to build these different application types. And that's not an ideal situation. Ideally, you would be able to invest in one platform that's appropriate across these different areas. So now to talk a little bit specifically about the markets. So when we think about an enterprise mobility deployment, uh, this kind of highlights the components that you need to build, deploy, manage, and secure your mobility deployment. Obviously, devices will be the endpoint that we access those applications on. And professional services are, are very important for many organizations as well. Um, when you think about strategy, a lot of organizations don't even know where to start with mobility because, again, it's complex. There's things that are changing all the time. And we see organizations maybe doing a mobile project in one part of the organization or another, but it's not always tied together in the most efficient way. And this is why you see companies going out and buying different solutions across different parts of the company, when ideally this should be a centralized strategy that they can really build, that they can really develop around one platform. Um, design is very important in the mobile world, so there needs to be a lot of focus on the UI, kind of UX of the, the application, and a lot of companies aren't going to have that capability within the organization that they have today. Um, and the implementation, because we talked about the challenges of, of integration. It's a very key service as well. And increasingly, we see companies that are interested in sort of offloading this to a, another third party. So we believe that the opportunity around managed services is going to grow over the next few years as well. So now if we look at enterprise mobility management, we, kind of, we see this kind of breaking into three uh, large subcategories, which are mobile device management, mobile application management, and mobile content management. And we believe that this is going to be a 2.1 billion market in 2017. However, um, as Costa said, I am updating the forecast right now, and I actually think it's going to be a little bit higher than that. Um, it's, I mean, it, it, the growth is amazing. 
we yearly are having to update our forecasts and go higher and higher and higher. Because um, you never want to, you know, you never, you always want to be careful to not go too high. But we, we are seeing the market really outperform our expectations year after year, which is a pretty amazing thing. So um, included in this could be a standalone MDM product, a standalone MAM, a standalone MCM, or a combination of the, the three segments. So when we dig into these segments a little bit, uh, just to get into an understanding of kind of where they stand today. So mobile device management is what this market was called for a long time. Um, and I think we started referring to it differently a couple years ago as we were probably two, three years ago at this point, because we really started to see it's not just about managing devices. That's an important piece of it. But what many enterprises are going to care about, especially as you move more into the BYOD scenario, isn't that you always need to lock down that entire device. It may be that you just want to manage the applications and the information on that device. Now, I will say I think that mobile device management is still key. It's still core. And uh, for the corporate liable device population, we think that that is still going to be you know, a very significant opportunity. We also see certain verticals that are going to want to lock down the whole device, even if it's a BYOD device. So we think it's important to have offerings across each of these categories. But like I said, increasingly, we are hearing a lot of interest in mobile application management. And I think mobile application management, the way that we think of it, is an umbrella term for mobile application management and mobile application security. So um, the App Store is also a key kind of piece of the, the management side of it. Um, and then when you talk about security, app wrapping and containerization are you know, a couple key approaches in terms of uh, being able to secure the application itself. And we could probably spend a half an hour alone talking about the technical differences between these two. But I think suffice it to say that they're both um, you know, viable methods of providing app granular application security. And that might be around a container of applications. It might be around just one application itself. Uh, mobile content management is the kind of next piece of the puzzle. So when we're talking about applications, those applications are probably linked to, to a database or some st kind of structured um, content somewhere. The other side of it is that we have um, all types of attachments that we're opening, PDFs and all kinds of you know, Word documents, and we need a way to secure that information flow between devices and our, our back ends as well. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle. And again, as we look into the future, you know, for the majority of the opportunity we talk about today, it's tablets, it's smartphones, but wearables are on the market now. And so we have to think about how does that impact us in the future and getting beyond wearables to all of these sensors that, that we're going to be uh, leveraging in the future as well. So now if we look at the uh, mobile application development market, this, this market has different names, MADP, MEEP, kind of same thing from our perspective. Um, we believe that the market exceeded a billion in 2017 and it's going to grow very rapidly over the forecast period because we believe that there's a lot of pent up demand for these uh, mobile application enablement players. Um, I think that it's, it's good in a way that the kind of the security and management side took off first because when you think about it, it's good to have some kind of security and management in place before you are deploying all these applications. But now that companies know that they have all of these um, employees out there, all these consumers to reach with smartphones, there's really a pent up demand for, for products that can enable uh, mobile applications. So we see that cloud-based solutions and HTML5 are really transforming the market. Cloud really enables companies to get up and running much quicker, and they don't have to make all these investments into infrastructure that they've had to make in the past. So they can get up and running much quicker. Their developers can go out there and you know, spin up an instance in, in, in a matter of minutes, which was not possible before. So it really speeds the time to market. HTML5 as well, since we were talking about the fact that you already have plenty of developers in your organization with those skills. We believe that mobile operators and the system integrator partner role is really going to begin to expand globally. Um, lots of, lots of partnership opportunities in this space. Professional services are really critical. Um, again, these, the integration piece can be difficult for an enterprise to go it alone, especially the first time. And so we really think that we're going to see a large um, booming services market around that supports these software markets. And uh, again, the mid-market grows in importance because we've seen enterprises attempt these projects in the past, but now 
SMBs and you know the kind of the mid piece of the market is really beginning to understand that they can do this too, especially by the fact that, that there's all these cloud solutions now and they don't have to make these huge infrastructure investments. And I think it's worth mentioning too, these market sizes that we're providing are for software only, so the services um, potential is, is, up, is above and beyond what we're projecting here for, for software. So I think it's important to wrap this section up by talking about the fact that we see a lot of convergence happening in these two markets. We do count them separately today, um, but I think when you think about security, it's kind of the piece that ties it together. Um, so when you think about management, there are a lot of um, companies that kind of started in that space. When you think about application development, and we're going to talk about how the landscape kind of, shake, kind of shakes out, um, there's a lot of companies that only play in that space too. But increasingly, when you think about the mobile maturity of customers, right? I think today a lot of customers go out there and buy point solutions. They buy a point solution for security, or they buy a point solution because they want to build an app. But once they start to understand the strategic importance of mobility, and it starts to go up the value chain, and they start to get executive sponsorship for mobility projects, then we see companies really thinking about it strategically. And we see them building mobile centers of excellence, where you're bringing a cross-functional group of people across the company into this mobile center of excellence to say, line of business, what are your needs? IT, what are your needs? And in this way, we see that the idea of a mobility platform starts to become really important because it can give IT what it needs in terms of security and management, and it can give line of business what it needs in terms of getting out those apps quickly. If you don't have this conversation, what we see happening is line of business goes out, builds a bunch of apps, deploys them through an app store, and IT has no involvement in the conversation. And this isn't secure at all. This is corporate information that you're allowing your employees to put on their devices. So we believe that it's very important to have that security fabric that, um, that uh, underlies your entire mobility deployment. And so that's why we believe that this convergence is very important and we'll, we think it will continue. So a few minutes on the com uh, competitive landscape. So if you look at this slide, this is a representative grouping of vendors that play across EMM and MADP. And there could be a lot more <laughs> uh, logos up there. But for space purposes, I think this is a good sampling. And what you'll notice is that it is a mix of kind of large enterprise software companies and a mix of, of pure plays. And that's complex for the customers trying to navigate this environment. Who do we go to for this? Who do we go to for that? They often have um, one vendor coming to them to solve one problem, another vendor for them coming to solve another problem, and it's confusing to them. We have relationships maybe with both of these companies. What do we do? So industry consolidation is definitely occurring at a rapid pace. 2010, that you know, SAP acquiring Sybase was a big one. I would imagine that if SAP didn't buy them, someone else would have acquired them because they had some you know, pretty good assets to bear in the mobile space. Then there was a little bit of a gap, but in 2012, and I think that that gap is somewhat accounted for by the fact that people were try companies were trying to understand what should the strategy be in this space. I think this was a year kind of, hmm, we know we should do something, but we're not really sure what we should do yet. So I think in 2012, we started to see that this whole consumerization trend was valid, it was real, it's happening, and we have to do something about it. Um, so we saw some interesting acquisitions um, across EMM and MADP 2012. Same in 2013, where a number of really interesting ones happened. Um, and then you can see in 2014 that there's no slow, slowing to this activity. There's already been four this year, and we're halfway through the year, where last year there were six in total. So this, uh, this uh, consolidation continues. And if I could think of kind of a few key trends um, to outline this, I think we saw companies who didn't have mobile products that were trying to leverage technology that they had for mobile, existing technology, they were trying to leverage it for mobile. And I think IBM is a great example of this, where they had some technology with WebSphere, um, but it wasn't quite doing the job for mobile, so they went out and acquired Worklight so they could have a specific mobile um, development platform. Same with Fiberlink, they had acquired Big Fix a few years ago and they were leveraging that technology for um, their mobile management capabilities, but I think that they really realized that they, they needed to have a mobile specific solution. So they went and acquired Fiberlink last year. 
Um, so that's one way of, of uh, one way that I saw this acquisition activity happening. Um, I think another way was companies saying, well, we have some mobile pieces, but we need more. And I think Citrix is a good example of that. They had done some um, work on kind of mobile application management internally, but they really realized that they were missing the device management piece of things. And so they bought Zenprise so they could scale out their EMM strategy. And I think, you know, increasingly what we're going to see is as the market starts to settle a little bit, it's not settled by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that you are starting to see customer companies realize what their strategy should be. So I think what you're going to see is a lot of interesting, uh, maybe smaller acquisitions of really interesting technology. I think if you think of someone like a Semantic, for example, Semantic's probably never going to get into the mobile application development space. Now, if they do, I'm not all knowing, but my guess is that they probably won't, right? So I think what they're really going to do is they're going to really build out their security and their management strategies, and they're going to look for really interesting little pieces of technology where they can differentiate in that space. So I think they're an example of one. They just bought um, NitroDesk. But I think that they'll continue to make um, strategic acquisitions. And it might be of smaller players you never heard of that just have really cool technology. So this is a view of the vendor landscape by submarket. Um, so if you look at this slide, we have um, a number of players that either, either kind of play on one side of the pond or the other. We have a fewer amount of players that have capabilities across both sides. Um, and where we see Globo really um, creating some differentiation here is this extensible container that they've built that um, uh, integrates the EMM and MADP into one solution. And again, this is really important because you want this, I, I just like, like the sport security fabric um, that underlies all of these deployments. And by leveraging a platform that has security from the get-go, so when you're building an application, you're building security into the application, um, it's, a really good, um, it's a really good method to ensure that your, uh, your mobility deployment is, is going to be secure all the way through, and the fact that they have capabilities to build across B2C, BDE, um, B2C, B2E, B2B, those are the three, um, is, is great too. The other thing that I think is important, um, which we talked about the services piece, is the ability to have a solution that is a platform yet is, is able to be offered in a modulized fashion because you still are going to have customers that have one need or another. It's also important to understand the company size segments and have different um, offerings that are targeted at each of these company size segments as well. And so I think these are some of the, the things that we, where we see Globo um, differentiating itself. So if we take a look at the future, um, this third platform, third platform compute and service paradigm is permanent. We are in the mobile, social, hyper-connected world. We don't think that this is going to change. But what's going to be really interesting is what we can do with all of these connections that we're making and all of this information. Um, I think that in some ways it's a little bit nerve-wracking too, right, from a privacy perspective. Um, and so I think privacy is going to be a, really a, a huge issue that we're going to have to deal with in the mobility industry moving forward. We, are, we know about BYOD, it's established, it's happening. Um, but we think that consumerization is just going to keep manifesting itself in, in new ways. And so bring your own app. This is really the idea of the Dropbox problem that we were talking about. Employees are now bringing their own apps into the enterprise, and they're leveraging those for corporate use. And so we have to understand um, what are they doing, and we need to find solutions that um, offer a solution for them for this problem because they're using Dropbox because they have a problem. So we need to offer a, um, a solution for that that is corporate sanctioned. And then manage your own content and, and beyond. And the possibilities are endless when we think about how the consumer world is going to impact the enterprise world. We believe that customer environments will continue to be highly heterogeneous. You're going to have a number of different needs across the customer environments. Every customer that you walk into is going to be a little bit different. And, um, so I think you know, the idea that having you know, services is really important so you can work with them to help identify the, the best strategy for, for that enterprise. We believe identity is the new endpoint, not devices, because again of the idea that the security perimeter is expanding. And so you can't think of your endpoint so much of it as a device anymore because the information is going past that device into another device, right? And it's going into the cloud. So we think that identity increasingly becomes a really important um, 
a really important concept in this space, and we think that security is going to become very much identity-based in the future. And then vendor selection is a future-proofing challenge. So as a company, you really have to think about this strategically, and you really have to partner with vendors who understand what is, why are you doing this mobility deployment. You're not just doing it for fun, you're doing it because you have real business results that you're looking to gain, yet you have to make sure that this is all going to be done in a compliant and secure way. So we really, you really want to work with your provider to understand their roadmap and see if their roadmap matches where you want to be over the next five to 10 years. I think that was all I had. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen. And if you have any questions, that's my email, that's my Twitter, and I'd be happy to continue the conversation there. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing the uh, upgraded outlook on uh, the market mm -hmm. size. The numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, remarkably, <laughs> we're exactly on time. And that means that you have 20 minutes of leisure before we reconvene to hear from Demetrius. Thank you. So reconvene at 3.40. Thanks so much indeed. Uh, we have uh, three more parts to the, the afternoon, starting with Demetrius Giparis with our financial update, over to Pat Costello for the panel discussion, and ending with Mittal Parekh uh, for the uh, product development pathway. So first of all, please let me welcome Demetrius. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much for attending this event. I'm uh, really proud to present you the best set of results the group has ever produced so far. So let's start from some financial highlights of 2013. Our revenue have grown by 55% to 71.5 million compared to 46 million last year. Strong growth across all business uh, areas, but mainly growth driven by our focus on enterprise mobility. This delivered also strong positive cash flow of 5.2 million before the effect of acquisitions. And uh, something happened with the slide. Let's move on to operating cash flow, cash conversion reach 83.2. In the operating free cash flow from minus 1.7 million H1, we have delivered a really strong H2 to 6.9 million, reaching to this 5.2 million before the effect of acquisition. As Costis mentioned before, we have a successful oversubscribed placing of 25 million net of proceeds. And also we have secured and we have started relationship with two strong banks, Barclays and East West United Bank, having a 45 million credit, li credit uh, line availability. So let's move now to more detail in our uh, statements, starting by income statement analysis. You see here the four major segments of our group. So starting from enterprise business, moving to consumer business, software as a service and telecom services, and third-party goods. So let's go to each one of them one by one. Starting with the enterprise business. So Go Enterprise generates revenues in three areas. The first one is EMM licenses, which are sold either on-premise or on cloud. The revenues are up 51% to 5.8 million. Moving to the MATB licenses, the revenue is really impressive, 300% up to 9.1 million compared to 2.3 last year. And also the MBS uh, division, the services, the revenue up 151% to 14.9 million. The consumer mobility business, the traditional business of our group, revenues are up 20% to 34.8 million generating uh, revenues in 35 countries, serving 6.5 million users, monthly users, and uh, 2.93 million active monthly users. Moving to the software as a service and telecom business, we have reached 5 million, 2% up compared to last year, and third-party goods revenues reached 1.9 million. So, okay, it's a bit complex. Of course, everybody has presentations in order to to go in uh, detail on this slide, is how we recognize our revenue. My first comment is that uh, we are full compliant with IFRS standards, of course, and uh, I don't want to get into details, but I just want to point out a couple of uh, uh, products and services here, starting with Citro Go and Go Social, which service and revenue is recognized after we deliver our service, 
of course, all costs are recognized at the same period, and invoicing follows reconciliation with our customers at approximately 1.5 months. Going to the Go Enterprise licenses you see annually perpetual, they are pretty much the same. The, dif the, the difference here is the annual is one year, of course, perpetual is three years. So we recognize 85% of revenue in the annual uh, license, 85% uh, of uh, the uh, revenue recognized uh, upon license activation, and the remaining 15%, which is mainly support and maintenance services, is deferred in 12 months. Of course, all relevant costs recognized at the same period. And the same pretty much applies to the perpetual, 55% of revenue recognized at license activation, and the remaining 45% uh, recognizing in the following 36 months. We have here the services, you know, the cloud services. If invoice annually, recognized in 12 monthly intervals. If invoice monthly, of course, at the invoice date. And following the MBS, the services that the project that we provide to our customers, the rec revenue recognized following contract terms and percentage of completion according to ERC 11. And of course, all relevant costs recognized at the same period. SaaS telecoms and third party goods, revenues are recognized after server delivery in the SaaS. And of course, in third party goods, recognized upon sale and transfer of ownership to the customer. So, some graphics here. You see here the historic revenue. The red one is the divested revenue that they left our group in 2012. And you see with the blue one from 46 million reaching this year, last year actually, 2013, 71.5. In the next uh, graph, you see here how Citron Go and Go Social Revenue, the traditional let's say mobile revenue comparing to the Go Enterprise revenue have evolved throughout uh, the years. I just want to point out here that within the second half of 2013, Citro Go Enterprise revenue has surpassed Citron Go revenue. And this is something that we're looking forward and we're going to uh, look as we see the figures moving on. This is uh, the trend uh, as we speak. So how we are work with our customers, how are the working capital cycle? Here are some typical terms. You see the enterprise mobility licensing terms are typically around 90 days. The mobility projects are, can run typically for six to nine months, sometimes can go even uh, longer than that. The collection terms is averaging four to five months. The consumer mobility uh, services around 120 to 150 days, and SaaS Telecom around 90 to 120 days. So this moves us to some more deep analysis of our balance sheet. I just want to point out here, not all uh, from a, a, our receivable side are actual receivables. You see here in inventories, you see relates to costs. So these are costs that are being as work in progress, are just costs that have been recognized and uh, as revenue, and the WIP amount has not been yet expended. But mainly here in the trade receivables, you see it's not the full account a receivable, you see here some costs as well, which is the advance payments to creditors. So what we consider as qualified receivables are the three, uh, let's say, highlighted uh, areas, the trade receivables, the actual trade receivables, the check receivables, and the notes. Which this leads us to how we have our DSOs with 2013 figures in our, in our, uh, in our, in our numbers, yes. So you see that the total is 143 days, but the most important thing is this is 99 days, which is the license. This means that as soon as we have more and more license from enterprise uh, uh, segment, the better the DSOs will become. And this is a trend as we speak within 2014 as well. And of course, all the above DSOs comply the commercial terms I just presented to you a couple of slides before. Some further analysis uh, in the balance sheet. You see the other receivables, the other current assets. Here you see the money that we expect from global technologies within the year, from uh, uh, yeah, the, man the management of global technologies. We expect the 500,000 to be uh, actually collected by 30 of June. And uh, I think yesterday or the day before, they have sent us a letter stating that uh, they are OK and with our payment, uh, we're expecting our money. The other current assets. Of course, the biggest figure here is the projects that are uh, we are uh, recognized revenue according to ES 11, and as soon as the project has been delivered, it's been invoiced and then moved to the trade receivable account. 
Some other important balance sheet uh, uh, accounts, the cash position, of course. Globo has uh, cooperation with several banks, banks across the globe, namely Greece, UK, Switzerland, US, Cyprus, and Dubai. At the end of 2013, our cash and cash equivalents amounted 64.2 million. Intangible assets are property. Intangibles reached, uh, investment in intangibles reached 14.6 million uh, within 2013, which is approximately 20% of the group revenues. I just want to point out our competitors, and Kostis has mentioned this as well, our competitors have spent much, much more in a percentage basis, reaching 40 to 50% of their total revenue. Amortization policy, three years straight line amortization policy, so 33.3% of uh, this cost within our cost of sales account. Goodwill, goodwill consists mainly of our acquisitions. So within 2011, reached further acquisition and the further acquisitions of the group of Notify and Dialect. Cash flow, I think the most important <laughs> account for, for all of us. So here we have produced a bridge, how we have generated this 64.2 million starting with 19.2 at the beginning of the year, adding the EBIT, uh, the working capital needs deducted, depreciation amortization charges, the equity contribution, the borrowings reaching this 64.2 million. Of course, uh, uh, as I already mentioned before, operating cash flow conversion is really nice figure, 83.2%. So why we say that we are free cash flow generative? We have produced here two ex actual, uh, uh, not examples, but uh, with a hypothesis that we start with zero cash at the beginning of the year. So having the EBIT here in 2013, having the EBIT, adding the depreciation, deducting uh, the working capital needs, we reach to this 5.2 million of free cash flow before the effect of acquisition. The same applied, we have, it's a second consecutive year actually to be free cash flow positive. 1.7 last year before the effect of acquisition with the same exact hypothesis. But I just want to point out something important here. You see the needs of working capital needs of 13.3 million within 2013. And you see this 12.4 million last year. So this is a 7% increase in working capital, but you have to compare it against 55% increase in our revenues. And this states how the collection have been much, much more improved. So as a summary, we continue to have strong, strong top-line growth. We have a, delivered a really nice cash generation H2 of approximately 7 million euros. The gross profit margin reached 56.2%. The operating profit margin 38.2%. The DSOs 143 days. And the year-end net cash at 43 million. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, yes, please. On the floor. Or even one question. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Hello. Uh, if you look at the major projection, projections that RBS have come up with and the change RBC? over the last, yeah. um, between April and October, the biggest change is in the increase in operating expenses that are now expected in the, the next year. Um, <coughs> what is behind that level of growth? And um, do you feel that it looks as though you're investing um, more to keep the revenues at the same level as you previously anticipated? Is that the correct assumption? Or do you see that as being a peak investment and then sort of tailing off? OK, good question. Uh, you see some uh, increase in operating expenses. And this mainly because uh, within 2014 and moving onward, we are focusing more and more in the US and the Western European markets. So as uh, we need to invest more in, uh, in people, uh, the, the costs are getting higher and higher. But we expect, again, uh, some revenue increase as well. Uh, allow me to, to say that uh, RBC is doing their work. They have their projections. Uh, we are in respect of these projections, and of course, we have our own projections, and you know, there is a comparison there. But uh, we are really optimistic. Within the first four months of uh, the year, 
Uh, the group is doing tremendously well. We are really pleased on that and looking forward to announce more and more following you know, the interim date, you know, the 30th of June. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'd like to welcome Pat Costello to the stage, or to the side of the stage, and yeah. uh, our three representative clients from. Uh, thank you, Mike. Do you want to? Yeah. Do you want to hang on to it? From our yeah, channel partner yeah. in Australia. Yeah. Um, Stavros. Stavros. Should we start with the mic? In okay. uh, Hellespost in uh, Greece. Thank you. Okay. Over to you, Pat. Yeah, thank, thanks very much, Mike. Okay, um, welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome our three guests that have uh, uh, travelled uh, uh, to be with us today. Um, you can see from the, uh, the symbols on the screen here, I'll move out of the way. Um, Costi's mentioned about uh, how we've sold through distribution. Um, these are represent our first two here, Tui and uh, Hellenic Post, uh, two direct customers. Um, They've got great stories to tell, and I think it really does give us a, a feel of the market. So on that note, I'm going to hand over first of all to the chap. So, Stavros, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, yourself and, the, uh, and TUI? Should just come on. Can you hear me? That's good. Okay. Okay, thank you, Patrick, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity given to me in order to present our case study here in a special audience like this. Uh, in the beginning, I'd like to say a few words for TUI, TUI LAS, actually. Uh, TUI LAS is a wholly subsidiary company of TUI Travel PLC, headquartered here in London. I suppose that everybody knows who is, which is uh, this company, this group at least. Uh, so, uh, TUI LAS uh, is a, a destination management company. Actually, uh, its main, ser its main purpose is to serve uh, exclusively incoming tourists in Greece. We currently hold the number one position among any travel organization and tourism company in Greece. So, uh, as you can understand, uh, our purpose not is not only to serve clients from the in-house companies, but also from third clients located everywhere in the world. This is a very important point. Okay, in order to handle and to operate, uh, uh, providing uh, the appropriate services to every client, regardless from where they are coming. Uh, Twilas had um, uh, 100 million euros turnover during the last fiscal year, and this year we expect more than 2 million incoming tourists uh, to handle uh, during this season, actually, in a season of six, five to six months. Imagine that these numbers contribute to something more, a little bit more, than 10% of the total incoming tourists visited Greece, expected to uh, visit Greece in, uh, in total. Imagine the, the volume that we have to handle, it's quite huge. Currently, I hold the position of IT country manager. I'm responsible for all the uh, communication information systems. Uh, we, as IT department, our main purposes, our main duties and responsibilities are to uh, manage and support 700 users, mostly uh, to your last personnel, permanent and seasonal, but as well as um, customers, employees who are locating in our premises and uh, they use our, uh, let's say, infrastructure in order to operate. Imagine that we have all these users spread over 15 branch offices and 10 more sales offices throughout Greece. Uh, in total, uh, whatever has to do with technology, IT infrastructure, business software application, and telecom, we, we are responsible to manage and maintain. On top of them, we also support almost 600 iPads, tablets, used by sales people in order to promote and to uh, sell our local products, mainly excursion, local excursion, but not only excursions, some other minor uh, products. So this is the main reason that I'm here, because I'd like to present this case study. Okay, thank you very much, Stavros. So, uh, moving to our second guest, perhaps you could introduce yourself. Sir. Hello, my name is uh, Damianos Dimitriadis. I am uh, the Information and Communication Technology Consultant of uh, uh, 
chairman and the CEO of Hellenic Post, Mr. Kosis Melakrinos. I would like to say a few words about uh, Hellenic Post, ELTA is the Greek acronym. Uh, it's a, a leader, it's a, it's a postal provider, the leader postal provider services in Greece and also provides uh, financial services. It has uh, one of the largest, probably the largest retail network in Greece with more than a thousand points of present. Uh, and uh, also is a universal service provider in Greece, the universal uh, service provider of uh, postal services. Uh, my role in the company is to, uh, to advise uh, the uh, company's management to decide uh, upon uh, the uh, investments and the uh, policy uh, concerning the application of uh, information and communication technology and also to analyze and uh, suggest solution on operational uh, issues uh, regarding the application of and the adoption of uh, information and communication technology. And, uh, okay. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Good afternoon. <coughs> My name is George Delagiannoudis and I'm the uh, CEO of Mobilize IT. Um, founded in 2004 um, with a number of colleagues of mine, Mobilize IT was created really to bridge the gap between traditional managed services um, in terms of IT and uh, to bring those into the mobile space. Um, so similar to Globo uh, pioneering uh, the application uh, and containerization space, we've been providing mobile managed services to customers uh, since 2004 and pioneering uh, that technology with offices uh, in or, or across Australia with offices uh, in Singapore uh, and New Zealand um, what we do is we provide frontline mobile managed services mobile infrastructure mobile applications uh, to some of Australia and uh, Asia Pacific's best known brands and mobile workforces okay thank you George yep. so Stavros if I could start perhaps uh, if we could talk through uh, here we go. A little bit more about um, mobility with TUI. Um, I think, uh, just, just to mention one of the facts when Stavros and I were talking, we were talking about how many Brits they actually, is TUI in Greece, how many Brits they're going to actually look after this summer. And just as one organisation. So how many, what was the number? Two million people. Yeah, but there was, there was about, uh, uh, how, many, how many Brits were you expecting? Uh, more than half a million. Yeah, more than half a million. That's almost 1% of uh, the population TUI are going to be looking after. Uh, for us. Now, in terms of mobility, mobility is not new to you, is it? No, it's not new. Perhaps you could give us a little bit more uh, uh, of an idea of how you've used mobility and, and where you see mobility within the business. Okay, uh, interesting <laughs> question because actually TLS is a worldwide pioneer in using uh, innovative mobile technology. Actually, we have implemented uh, mobi mobility, uh, mobile solution uh, at least the last, the last 10 years. And we have implemented this uh, uh, solution in order to promote and to advance our sales channels. We have used RAT, all PDAs, platforms, and devices, all quite old devices and methodologies and platforms. And uh, we managed successfully, okay, to promote these sales channels. And uh, now, of course, this is a new challenge. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, based on this, based on this, uh, we uh, would like to have a new uh, reliable uh, mobile solution. Why? Because the existing solution is outdated. But this new mobile solution should be uh, fully adapted with the existing system. This is something that Costis mentioned in the beginning, that the challenge here is how you link and we degrade the mobile platform with the back office systems. So we should, find, we should find a solution ready to install and implement it in our case because the season had already started. So we should proceed the soonest possible in order to apply the solution, implement it, and to have fully linked with the back office system. So the challenges are quite big. Yeah, yeah. And, and in terms of um, the, the challenges, uh, the, the implications of this not working? Great story. Okay. <laughs> Applications. Imagine that we have an outdated solution that couldn't be extended or upgraded anymore. This is a huge problem. We have a solution not uh, uh, functioning properly for many reasons. Uh, imagine that 
some of you, some of you may be aware of this, we use Windows Internet uh, mobile uh, environment, it's quite old. So we couldn't upgrade it. And the only alternative way apart to find a new solution was to migrate into manual process. Can you imagine manual process in a business like this? We're talking about 500,000 reservations. We're talking about huge extra workload for our operation who has to do this manually. And of course, a lot of problems may be arising after this for the sales people and for the operation as well. But at the same time, imagine the operating cost because in order to cover the same business needs, you should hire more people to cover exactly the same case. So in terms of the engagement with Globo, we, we, we've not, um, we, we know it's a competitive landscape. We're not the only vendors in this space. Mobility is a very exciting area, so therefore we know there's some very large corporates, there's some very bespoke organisations. What was the, can you talk us through perhaps the engagement you had with Globo and, and how you found working with us? Okay. Uh, it's not so simply answered because before we have an engagement with Globo, we should have a market inquiry about the potential candidates. So we should find a service provider who uh, can be capable of understanding the high business complexity of TUI. This is something not very easy, believe me. Worldwide, it's quite difficult to find a, consi a consulting firm or someone from the technology who can understand very easily this complexity. The first one is this. The second one is that you, you should find a software company service provider who has significant experience in complex, in high complexity, sorry, IT projects in mobility solutions. Second point. The third point is that we should find a service provider who had who has significant experience and extended knowledge in iOS platforms because our decision was to marry with Apple products. So for us, it was an important uh, requirement during the RFP process. So we should find a service provider fulfilling all these uh, criteria. Okay. So, so what, I'm, what I'm hearing here, is, again, and this is a, is a, is a business challenge that we face. Uh, my role is commercial. I'm leading a team. It's a very competitive landscape, but one with lots of opportunity. And customers are looking not for product, they're looking for solution. Exactly. And, I, and I think that's what we've just heard there. Yes, yes, of course. There are many achievements. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we managed to deliver a brand new uh, innovative solution in less than two months. This is a great achievement. So uh, could, I, could I just... Two months? Yes, two months uh, took us in order to uh, adopt this new solution, okay. to describe all the business cases, to yep. translate it into the integration part with SAP, and so it's very, important, the it's very important here to mention that we use SAP since 1997. I don't believe that there are many companies who, uh, which are using uh, SAP so many years. And this SAP version that we have is fully adaptable to tourism operation. Quite difficult, customized completely. So the challenge here was how you can link this mobility solution with an existing SAP system. You know the difficulties behind this. You may understand probably. And we managed to do this so we have, after two months, a fully linked solution ready to accommodate, to uh, uh, receive sales reservations. We're talking about 500,000 reservations, okay, fully into the system, meaning less manual work to our people, both for operation and accounting department, because both parties have a significant role during this process. And imagine that we can avoid a lot of operating costs because uh, in, addition, in addition to this, okay, operation people can focus mostly on how you can, they can support sales processes, not in other manual processes. And imagine something else. There are still competitors okay, who, uh, which, uh, who uses uh, manual processes till now. Okay, so, so to me, that, that sort of puts it in perspective. I mean, you're up in your volume of business whilst actually not increasing the number of people. You, well, the, the implication is you wouldn't, be able to, you wouldn't be able to trade the way you are trading and making the most of your customers. Look, 
apart from the cost efficiency that you may have yeah. by adopting a, a such solution, this is a, an additional factor in order to increase your revenues because yes. uh, you promote the brand name of TUI, having innovative solutions. So in the eyes of your partners, your tour operators, your sorry uh, clients, okay, you have a modern solution, you facilitate the work, you uh, speed up the process, so this means more revenues and of course better image okay, and reputation to your clients and to your clients' clients, if you understand what I mean. Because tour operators are the B2B customers, but the end client is the B2C customers. Actually, not our customers, but the result of them is the result, the success of uh, our clients. Okay, great. That, I think that's, that's really just perhaps illuminated some of the points Stacey brought up earlier with regard to the market and why mobility isn't just a fad. It's a way of living and it's a way that's going to drive the way we interact with organisations. Cost, as you mentioned about the Internet of Things, it's how we, our lives are changing and it's better customer service, it, it's more effective, it's the way... Not only this, uh, facilitates also the work of our users. Yes, of because, course, most important. Because this means, this means your customer. better reporting, mm. high connectivity issues that we had in the beginning, solving security issues that we have because the existing solution wasn't PCI compliant solution. So we should have a new solution, PCI compliant, acceptable by the group because yeah. it's, not f it's forbidden at all. And it's forbidden at all also for the, from the bank and financial institution cooperated with TLS. All these have some side effects, so we should find a solution as soon as possible. That's why we opt for a solution as soon as possible. Yes. That's why we should run with Globo in order to yeah. complete it very fastly in two months. And now we are already one month in uh, full functionality. This is a great achievement. And uh, believe me, trust me, in the <laughs> beginning I didn't uh, believe that we could manage it, but this is reality. <laughs> I'm here because there are results, otherwise I wouldn't be here. I but have a uh, promise to Costi that I can <laughs> be, but only if I have positive results. And this is the reality. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Stavros. Thank you. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to turn here. Here we have a, uh, um, you know, a public sector organisation um, across Europe, across the globe. This is a traditional, the post office. It's um, something that we've all been used for the last few hundred years. Those in the uh, room that are UK uh, residents will know the amount of stuff we read in the newspapers and hear um, about modernising our own post office. So I think this is something that will, uh, uh, yeah, let, let, let's have a listen. So, let me ask, please you could perhaps share with us the situation that's led us to this conversation. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, let me say uh, some few words about the postal market worldwide. Mm, please. Because it's a market who is changing rapidly. Absolutely. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, pressures in this market. Uh, the traditional uh, post market is, uh, is decreasing and there is an uh, immediate need to enrich, for the postal operation to enrich the, uh, the uh, uh, the batch of services who offer to, to people and to companies and also to lower the cost. Of course. Uh, and uh, to maintain or increase the level of quality. This is, uh, these are uh, global challenges uh, and uh, also Hellenic Post faces these challenges and is uh, currently under a, a reorganization uh, process, a complex process of reorganization. Uh, this organization concerns the um, concentration of uh, postal offices op owned and operated by the Hellenic Post, the attraction of more postal agents to maintain its uh, level uh, of presence, its level of services, but uh, to decrease the cost, and also to, um, uh, to enrich the, uh, the quality, the responsiveness, uh, is positivity and uh, the, the batch of services offered to, the, to our uh, valuable uh, business customers who are uh, one, our greatest part of our revenues and to, to, uh, the, um, to the to citizens and to, 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 to customers, uh, retail customers also. And uh, this needs uh, uh, relates to 
proof of delivery to financial services, end-to-end uh, uh, -end financial services. We, sell, uh, we give uh, pensions to elderly, uh, uh, mainly in the rural areas and the island uh, Greece. And also we transfer money and uh, provide this type of services. And uh, all these challenges and this uh, continuous reorganization, uh, this ongoing reorganization yeah. process, uh, uh, focuses uh, as a company uh, to mobility as a potential solution because the current situation is uh, quite inflexible. We, ha we are a, a very big company, yes. uh, about uh, 8,000 uh, employees as a group. We have a traditional uh, client server and uh, uh, desktop messaging systems. And uh, we also have uh, about 2,500 of postmen uh, outside. Okay. Okay. Uh, in order to, uh, to uh, uh, apply to, to, uh, to fulfill these targets I mentioned before yes. efficien efficiently, we have to be able to uh, create new services to support them uh, as an as a, uh, uh, IT infrastructure and also to do this securely because we uh, manage uh, personal information and also ma manage financial information. Uh, currently, we have uh, adopted uh, Go Enterprise as a BO solution for top management for managers. Uh, to uh, have access uh, to the company's uh, data and also to increase uh, the company's responsiveness uh, to, uh, to, st to standard operation. But the biggest challenge is uh, to adopt uh, mobile technology and uh, beyond, uh, uh, beyond systems uh, for example, to increase our, uh, our uh, network of agents. Yes. The current approach we use uh, so far is to try to include this network of agents in our uh, uh, VPN, uh, and this uh, makes uh, uh, corresponds to cost and uh, time. It's a uh, it's a pr it's a procedure that takes time and uh, costs uh, a lot. And this cost also is transferred to the postal agents, which makes uh, a, a, a threshold that has to, to, to overcome in order to, to come to, co to cooperate with us. So if I may, I mean, what, I'm, what I'm picking up from that is you know, the, the, the implications of, of a post office not changing the way it works. It, it's just got to change. And that's yes. not just increased. That's, that's global. It's, you've got to change the way you work. Yes, exactly. You've got to embrace new technologies. You've got to ensure that the traditional postie that delivers the parcel or the letter actually does a lot more. Yes. And, and also the fact is you have to utilise an infrastructure that probably doesn't exist. So there's, it's not a fixed infrastructure. You're using a wireless, you're utilising a mobile device in order to let that individual deliver more and therefore effectively... The, the, the business survives and thrives, dare I suggest, <laughs> uh, rather than being subsidised, as many post office operations have been. I'm looking here in the UK, I'm sure in Greece, other countries across Europe, not sure about the US, but um, appreciating it's a new way of working. So perhaps you could just share with us, in, in, in terms of your experience of working with Globo, um, how, how have you found that? What, what have you... What's the interaction been like? Uh, the interaction uh, is uh, very promising and uh, for the time being it's uh, successful and fruitful uh, for both of us. Uh, but uh, the, the, um, the greatest uh, um, attraction is mm -hmm. the ability to build up rapidly, as Stavro said, new application yeah. inside a secure container. Yeah. Because we have to expand a set of uh, uh, services uh, to people, to, uh, to entrepreneurs, postal agents who are outside yes. our company. They don't use our network. They don't use our so hardware. This is, this is people so using their own kit, their own hardware, yes. their own device. There are people who, who operate small uh, stores. 
Okay. Like newspapers or yeah, something. Yeah, so yeah. And yeah. so they, they uh, want also to, to offer postal. Yes, yes to, uh, totally independent. To offer postal services. So they have to use our uh, services, our systems. Yes. But with not, uh, uh, with not uh, our hardware, and also to to do it securely without having to install expensive and uh, time-consuming visual private network inside them. So BO is an excellent option yeah. for this because they can use their own hardware, a tablet, a pad, or a, a notebook with a Microsoft, a Microsoft uh, Windows uh, 8.1. Yeah and uh, use a standard ADSL connection with a secure channel on top of it and to communicate to, to our uh, system securely and with n uh, no anxious of, uh, of our administrator what is the situation in, the, uh, in their hardware and their mm. system because this container is separated and secure and we don't care about what everything else is also installed in the, uh, at his machine. It's a, it's a very... Uh, uh, win, it's a very clear win-win uh, win situation. Here. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I, and I think demonstrates the trends that IDC, we've seen today, and Gartner mentioned about how an organisation can utilise an individual's device. They don't have to buy the hardware. The individual's quite happy to have a single device that they use for their own personal use, but to use it for a business purpose. And I think that's a fine demonstration of that trend. So... <laughs> And also there's also uh, another also, mm. uh, this, uh, the, f uh, the previous was about uh, agents. There's also another concerning our postmen. We have 2,500 postmen, as I said before. Yeah. We have to, uh, to, to, to supply them with a, a, with a service capable to prove the delivery Kay. and also to provide uh, quality figures and traceability to know when it, uh, uh, it was delivered and uh, to know uh, to also to, to have the ability to uh, analyze uh, the efficiency of our network and to, to yes. make improvements and also to secure the uh, financial uh, services, money yes. transfer, checks and yes. uh, so on. And uh, the best way to do this, it's using a, a build solution with a mobile phones. We can adopt also a very expensive uh, PDAs, like uh, pro uh, professional PDAs, yeah. but it's, it, it should be far less flexible and much more uh, expensive. Okay. Conscious of time, we've got a man here who's travelled from the other side of the world. <laughs> Demos, and, and that last point, and thank you very much, if I may just... Uh, How fast do we need Oops. to go? <laughs> so, um, I welcome George. George, uh, we, we've talked. Um, just to put it in perspective, just remember here, George is providing services here to uh, a very large network of customers. Um, the focus here we want to talk about, I think, is, is very much on the uh, Australian healthcare uh, piece, which I think leads very much from the last point. So, George, over to you. Tell me, what, 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 have you, what have you been doing? Where, where's, where's the opportunity? What have you been... Uh... Well, I suppose from one traditional service, uh, the medical fraternity is probably another um, traditional service. Absolutely. And what we sort of see, one of Mobilise IT's fastest uh, growing markets is, is the health market, and they have a phenomenal appetite for uh, managed services and mobile infrastructure right through to, um, to applications. And the, fu the fundamental reason for that is that uh, like uh, every public healthcare um, system, uh, there are limited resources and, uh, and limited capability. So we really need to, as an industry, learn how to use and do more uh, with what we've got. So from a health point of view, um, the health industry really had to smarten up in terms of how they use uh, their current infrastructure. And, and the perfect example is where um, you know, hospitals are, are, are great for... Uh, for pre-operative and acute care, uh, not for post-operative care. And, um, and what we sort of see is the medical fraternity um, have basically sort of said that uh, customers are more attuned to uh, receiving health care um, at home, okay, and, uh, and are more responsive to health care and less prone to infection. So 
So all of a sudden, what we sort of find is we find a phenomenal solution whereby uh, the stresses of the public health care system can be uh, relieved to a certain point by uh, beginning to provide that post-operative uh, care in the home. And, uh, and obviously with that is a, a flurry of organisations that have been providing traditional care in hospital now uh, moving to mobilise all of that infrastructure and all of that capability uh, and, and deliver those services in home. So. Okay. Okay. As 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 one major opportunity. Yeah. Uh, okay. And and when I when I look at the uh, the implications of that not happening, I mean we're in a we're in a generally speaking in the in the world we live in, population's growing older. It's it's a it's a situation that's growing. How, how do you see the opportunity? You know, we 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 talked um, about Australia specifically, but how do you see the opportunity within this space? For healthcare. Well, the, the, the opportunity in the space, like, like Damien, there's obviously a lot of, um, a lot of hesitation uh, with, within that particular industry. Um, obviously, what they've been doing, they've been doing for quite a while and not very prone uh, to change. So yeah. one of the reasons why uh, the Go Enterprise platform was, was very attractive, and, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about a specific um, uh, opportunity that we'll be announcing, uh, which is a significant win. Uh, for Mobilise IT and Globo in the particular health space is that we were able to quite quickly um, replicate and provide a core piece of uh, a mobile application that they required prior to the tender being completed. And, and the rationale for doing that was one, we wanted to remove all of those prohibitive uh, factors for them obviously making, uh, making a decision. So the opportunity for both Mobilise IT and Globo was quite significant, but more importantly, we were able to provide a, I suppose, a, a way to, to develop ubiquitous um, applications and capability in a very, very fast and very controlled fashion. And uh, if you look at what health customers are looking for, that's literally the benchmark um, of, of capability. And I think that um, that's where the Go Enterprise platform uh, was squarely in that particular area. Okay, okay. So if, uh, if, I'm, if I'm summing up for that, um, what we've got here, you've demonstrated again an, another traditional Care, care is traditional, it, it, uh, it, it's grown, it's growing. They're not usually adopters of new technologies, as you say, uh, perhaps uh, some of the uh, Te users... Technophobic. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's a case of the users being key. We talked about uh, TUI and the, uh, the, 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 the TUI employees on resort you know, with, the, with the technology. The technology has got to be friendly for them. Um, we talked about user interfaces, and uh, you had some thoughts on user interfaces, George. And well, the, the user interface was critical. Um, so the ability to um, to quickly replicate uh, the the forms and the UI that uh, you know the particular health industry were were accustomed to was was critical in making sure that they felt comfortable. That mm. what we were doing is we weren't actually transitioning them to foreign. Uh, technology, but to um, to technology that I c they could actually see um, was exactly what they were using, just on a different pane uh, yeah. or a different glass. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So so again, um, I'm I'm hearing you know, that it, it's important to have that consistency, to have a, a, a quick, rapid platform for development, um, and a huge marketplace. <coughs> Correct. I mean, how, how do you see the future of, uh, of, of, of mobility, for an instance, in, you know, within your own business and serving your customers and the customer base? Well, if we look at uh, from, from a, well, I suppose one of the major reasons why we were attracted to, um, to Go Enterprise and, and, and to Globo as an organisation was that um, as a mobile managed service provider, we knew that at some point in time, uh, mobile managed services would become a mature buying pattern and obviously competitors would enter into that particular market. So we had to raise uh, our value proposition to one, differentiate and through obviously increase our, um, our revenue and our stickiness within, yeah. within the customer base. So, so what we sort of see is that, um, is that in, in terms of the market, um, you know, we think that the health market uh, in, in Australia alone um, you know, could be in excess of two to two and a half billion dollars in terms of revenue. Uh, in terms of user counts, um, you know, we're talking about a massive workforce. Um, uh, at a state-by-state -state level, you know, we're expecting that, um, that each state health system would employ um, in itself uh, you know, somewhere between 100 and 150,000 uh, public servants, and that doesn't actually include the private sector. So, so okay. the opportunity is, um, is massive. 
and uh, and obviously uh, one of the key ingredients for us is we wanted to make sure that it was uh, it was successful um, and and as the Greeks sort of say knock on wood because it was our first ever opportunity <laughs> of partnering together which actually um, yeah, ended up being a, a successful um, win which I'm, I'm being a little cryptic about, but, um, but yeah. you will be hearing more about that over the next um, uh, coming days and, so and, and the next few days where uh, we'll make a significant announcement um, in, in a win and an opportunity. But the important thing about that is that, that success um, is self-professing with that industry. Um, you know, so what we expect is the learning and the capability that we'll be delivering to this one particular organisation. And, and we're talking about technology such as HL7 uh, certification, similar to, um, to Stavros and the PCI compliance. Okay. We'll be delivering a, a, a regulatory compliant capability that um, can then be replicated across not only Australian um, or the Australian healthcare industry, but also the global um, healthcare industry as a whole. So. Um, you know, what that amasses to, I think I, I, IDC may be better positioned to give us a view there. So, <laughs> Okay, okay. Yep. So, um, chaps, thank you very much again from all of us. Um, some very illuminating uh, conversation. And uh, um, I'd like us all to just put our hands together for the guys. Thank you. Thank you. Again, to the minute, we're on time. So uh, for the next half hour, here's Mittal to talk about uh, product strategy. Over Thanks, to you, Mittal. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. I'm Mittal Parekh, and I'm responsible for product strategy and product marketing. So I know I'm the last one. I don't have all these juicy details for you but hang in there, okay, it's only 30 minutes. So let's put it in perspective. So you met the architect, Costas. Now you are meeting the mason, okay? All the things that he mentioned, I'm going to make it happen. So uh, let's understand what's going on from product perspective. Uh, three big buckets. Uh, Stacy, Costas, and our customers, they rightly mentioned how difficult, how complex, how consuming the mobile application or enterprise mobility market is. And I'm going to try to give you a little more perspective on uh, how difficult, generally how complex and difficult it is. Uh, the second big bucket is what are we doing right now, our products that are meeting the needs at present. And last and the biggest one of all is what are we doing to make sure that our platform is future-proof and it's able to meet all three mandates that Costas has put on us. So his basic asks are very simple. Let's build a complete enterprise mobility management platform. Let's build a globally scalable platform. And last but not the least is that we must have uh, products and markets well developed over time. Okay, so, and that's what you are going to see in my slides going forward. So first things first, we already saw this one that Gartner uh, recognized Globo in 2014 enterprise mobility management uh, magic quadrant. Uh, we've already gone through this one. I want to highlight one thing here is that when you look at completeness of vision, Gartner has put Globo uh, ahead of uh, competitors like BlackBerry and SAP. Uh, to put something in perspective here, last year's R&D expense for BlackBerry was 1.3 billion US dollars and for SAP R&D expense last year was 2.2 billion euros from their uh, 10Ks, just to keep it in perspective. So when you see those competitors and we are right ahead of them, that speaks a lot. We are the only new entrant. So they evaluated 100 players, 14 got selected to be in this quadrant and we are the one new entrant. There are players who got ruled out. So if you compare 2013, uh, MDM versus 2014 uh, EMM, you will find that there are three of our competitors missing. And what does it tell you? That they made it more difficult to get into this box. And in that context, we found a position. There are vendors, they are, they are stagnating. They've uh, slid from uh, their existing position last year to south or west or southwest, right? Uh, I leave it up to you to uh, pull out 2013 report and compare. And this is going to be the journey of our lives. We are going to go from here to right that shows completeness of vision. 
and onwards to top right. So it's not a two-step process. It's going to be continuous evolution. However, completeness of vision is in my hands. I can develop the best product. However, the execution and the way it is perceived depends on us as well as competitors and customers. So that's the path going forward. Let's look at the market. It's a tall order. Okay, let's, let's not kid ourselves. When you look at uh, consumption of enterprise mobility platform, consumption of application development platforms, right? There are four major constituencies. Let's go one at a time. Enterprises, right? Uh, large enterprises, SMBs, mid-market, what have you. Their enterprise mobility needs are very different. Right? They are looking to uh, secure their devices, secure their applications, secure the data that's being used by those applications. They want to, the biggest of all, these enterprises want to mobilize their existing uh, applications sitting inside their infrastructure. These are the companies they've invested in IT resources in 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and now suddenly they want to take all those things and put it on those iPads, on those Samsung devices. How do they do it? And the challenges are very different. On the other side, you have third-party independent software vendors. Take any favorite I iPad or iOS application that you like that, that's on your uh, phone right now. And those developers, right, their needs are very different. They would like to develop cross-platform applications. Mind you, that's the keyword here, cross-platform applications without losing arm and a leg, developing for each individual platform, okay? And they want to bake in various different uh, feature functionality from uh, security to integration with various cloud services to the best user interface and user uh, experience into those applications. Just how do they do that? Right? They do not, again, that's not, uh, they, everybody is working with limited set of resources. Let's look at mobile application development shops. These are outfits. They go develop applications for enterprises, for mid-market companies, and their primary objective is to do more with less. Their job is to find the right uh, application platform development tool that allows them to develop an application without having to rework for each and every platform, to be able to connect those applications to backend for their customers, and to provide end-to-end -end security, just to name a few. Okay, and last and the biggest growing segment is independent vendors. So these are the vendors or contractors, one or two or five man army, and that's the largest growing segment. Their job is very simple. Uh, you pay them one fixed amount, they give you an application, they give it for multiple platforms, and for them, this is heaven. As you will realize going forward in coming slides that uh, we are the only one where it is truly cross-platform application development and deployment, okay? So now look at types of application that get developed, right? I, uh, I heard Stacy say that now there are B2B, B2C, and dot, dot, dot. The, primarily, there are four application types of applications that these consumers develop uh, or these customers. Let's start with B2E, business to employees. These applications are very different. They have very different needs in terms of being able to authenticate the user, being able to provide security, being able to provide access to their uh, IT backend systems that they've been using. For example, we just heard that we are able to provide connections to SAP that was customized for tourism. Classic example, right? Uh, for example, for B2B, business to business applications, these are a little different, where two businesses are exchanging information. So it's uh, you, user interface, user experience is just as important as being able to connect to two-way IT systems. Those are way different than the B2E systems and how these applications are deployed, how these applications are used. When you look at B2C, business to consumer, this is your favorite application on your device, right? The, the focus there is more on UI, on UX, being able to push information in the right way. The focus there is to be able to develop an application once and for all, publish it on four uh, app stores, and get done with it. And last but not the least, uh, G2C, that's government to citizens. These applications are even further different. Right? These are, so City of London providing you an app that you download on your uh, iPhone, and they are able to tell you when the road is uh, closed, when something is being worked on, uh, there's no electricity, what have you. Right? These are very different when it comes to the way these apps got developed, tested, deployed, secured, and managed. Okay? Now, when you look at enterprises, they have found this, uh, you know, this new playground. This is like a kid in Disneyland. 
suddenly they want to experience everything. They want to try out everything. If you think from their perspective, they are. Let's understand from EMM enterprise mobility management. They they are going to say, okay, I'm going to pick and choose a device security, app security, data security, security to this level, and what have you, connection to that level, uh, th those resources. So they they want to choose from there. They want to choose how they deploy it. Many a times they say, you know what, I have resources, I'm a bank, I would like to keep it in-house. Whereas other third-party ones, you know, smaller ones or mid-sized, they would say, I don't want that headache, you manage it for me. They, they want to have various different licensing types. They want to have various dis uh, different licensing terms. Right? These are not just business-level decisions. They have to be baked into technology. And last but not the least, most of them, they start thinking, so do I want to put a Band-Aid for now, or do I want to plan it well? So then there comes the professional services as to the enterprise mobility management vendor will have to offer, will have to have a full-grown end-to-end professional services organization as well. right? Only that vendor, only those players are going to win where you are able to cater to all these variety of needs. And all along, since afternoon, early afternoon, we have been listening one thing, application this, application that. It's all about applications. They are talking about whether it is uh, application that you download for, from uh, App Store or you develop that connects your resource, internet resources. It's all about apps. One of the survey recently conducted by uh, one of the IT giants, they asked 1,300 IT managers over 41 countries, and this is the answer. 63% of them couldn't stop talking about applications. Right, everybody wants to mobilize applications, uh, take uh, build new app, uh, deploy their existing workflow as an app. Just how expensive and how difficult it is to build a meaningful app. So there are different types of applications, and these are the costs associated with uh, developing, testing, deploying, managing, securing. Okay. Now multiply this by five, at least for five platforms. That's where you are going to find that end goal of being able to satisfy most of your end users. Right? So when you start thinking about uh, a vendor that's saying, oh, I have application development platform, ask as to how, how many resources, how much of a resource is required in order to develop an app for one platform, and then how much additional for the next and the next and the next. And then you'll realize that it doesn't remain cost effective anymore, and nobody has infinite resources. So let's look at the product lineup as, it, as we have right now. That's uh, very well meeting the needs of our customers. So the very first thing Cost is asked of us is that complete enterprise mobility management portfolio. right? And that's what we have at this point. Uh, we probably have one of the best and end-to-end -end EMM portfolio. Let's look at the first one in that is mobile device management, right? Everybody talk, likes to talk about uh, mobile device management. Oh, it is being commoditized and this and that. Uh, not so true. And if you want the proof, go and read 2014 Enterprise Mobility Management Gartner Report, the MQ series report. And even today, they are cautioning against many vendors on incomplete nature of this offering. Okay, And this is the time and I'm going to share with you more on this one. And we have Go Enterprise Workspace Container. We saw in uh, Stacy's slide that enterprise mobility management is mobile application management, mobile device management, and mobile content management. Well, our Go Enterprise Workspace is uh, offered on four platforms. So it's truly platform agnostic. And it includes way more than what she just mentioned. So we start with mobile email management. We have mobile application management. We have mobile content management within that. And we are going to go through a few more in coming slides. But the whole idea here is put this together gives you confidence that this set can manage your device, your applications, and the data that's being consumed by those applications. Okay. Now comes the kicker. Globo's mobile application development platform. Okay, so this is the platform that allows, that enables our customers to take their existing IT workflow, their existing IT systems, and mobilize those and deploy those inside our workspace. 
So our workspace is a super secure environment where your, your employee, where your end user can pretty much live their corporate life. And now you are going to take your existing workflow and make it available, existing workflow as an application inside the container. Let's look at each of these elements. So enterprise mobility management, the first piece is mobile device management. I'm not going to go through each and every line item here, but it is sufficient to say that uh, we are one of the very, very few players where we have full end-to-end -end MDM offering that covers all four major platforms. So we don't stop at iOS and Android. We have iOS, Android, Windows, and BlackBerry. And you will find vendors talking about how do I quickly move you out of BlackBerry. We would rather have you include that in your offering, in your uh, uh, EMM platform that you offer to your end users or your customers. We are not going to stop our innovations here. Right? These are four uh, items out of tons of them that I mentioned here, that I mentioned here, that these are some of the things we are working on right now on the MDM side of the story. So uh, we are going to get advanced uh, application support from MDM side. We are going to enhance to include the iOS uh, VPV, that's volume purchase program, and device enrollment program. I can go into technical details after this session if you like. We are going to put that in. And uh, last but not the least, everybody knows Samsung, their super secure Knox environment. And guess what? They offer that security. We are going to raise the bar and offer one more layer on top of that by making this platform available and to be managed by our uh, MDM. Okay, and so again, four major platforms and innovations coming along the way. So secure workspace, okay? I want you to start from bottom up. Let's look at the last one first. So it has the biggest factor here is custom apps built using Go App Studio. So, uh, I want you to understand there are three big boxes in here, okay? Whenever we talk about Go Enterprise, or uh, let's do that later. Go Enterprise Workspace, the secure container, right? This secure container, can, uh, we provide inside that the whole PIM, the personal information manager. So that includes your uh, email, your calendar, your uh, contact, and what have you. Now, on top of that, this includes mobile content management. So if you are using SharePoint at your workspace, then SharePoint is now made available here inside the container, just one example. So we have end-to-end -end MCM mobile content management inside this. We have end-to-end uh, -end, uh, mobile application management. So any application that gets deployed inside this container now gets the highest level of security, that's uh, military-grade AES-256 encryption on the container and every application that appears inside it. Uh, mobile browser management, so you have secure browser inside it. On top of all these things, ask yourself, there are, uh, what do you do when you want to interact with your uh, coworkers? Many a times it's just a mess, matter of send, sending them an SMS or some form of IM, right? With Go Enterprise Workspace, we also offer one-on-one -on -one, uh, secure chat and one-to-many group chat. These are only handful of features. Once you get to know the container well, you will realize that this you can pretty much live your corporate life inside this container. Right? You can be productive inside this container, not have to come out of it. And the last one where we are able to take, as I mentioned, your existing workflow and mobilize it or existing application and put it inside this container to be able to make your end users more productive. And this container is also available on all four platforms. So that's iOS, Android, Windows, and BlackBerry. Right? So same container, same way of deploying your applications. And here comes the big kahuna, mobile application development platform. So let's break this into three big chunks, or three, from the way to think, at it, think about it, right? You have the development studio that somebody is going to develop an application. You have a server component that you push that application to, and then you have a, behind the server various ways of connecting into various uh, resources, such as SAP, the way uh, uh, TUI connected. Right? So you have these three things in order to make this magic happen. However, mind you, this is near zero touch. So what does it mean? For the very first thing is you you do not have to sit and code. You do not have to sit and uh, train anybody in order to make this uh, develop this application, cross-platform application. So you just code once, 
for all four platforms. So no coding required. You get apps for all four platforms. And whenever a little bit of coding is required, because I say near zero touch, it's all about JavaScript, CS, and HTML5. So right now, the reality is even a high school student is able to code HTML5. Okay, so this is no, there's no rocket science in this one. So we have taken a household technology that's being used by everybody and their grandmother and made it available to develop enterprise applications, right? Build once, deploy anywhere. As I mentioned, that you code it just once. Now, think about this one. When you go and try out any other mobile application development platform, I'm not going to uh, give you names, but try top three of them and you will put in your effort to develop an app one time for one platform, that's say iOS, hypothetically. 30% rework required for Android. Another 20% required for BlackBerry. So by the time you're done developing one application, you are tired. Okay, and when you come here, you, no, that's true. To go and try it out, and let, let's talk after that, right? You come here, and you get end-to-end -end security control and compliance from IT side, while your IT person putting resources just once with languages he already knows or she already knows. Okay, this is very powerful if you sit and use it. Okay, coming from engineering background, I've used it. So I can tell you this is not uh, hot air, this is real. So, however, it's more than just products. Okay, we have learned from our customers that everybody wants to now, now that they've seen all these things, they want to take the whole of their corporation and put it inside that container or mobilize it overnight. Okay? This is not an easy job. Right? You, there are vendors that are going to give you tools to do piece part elements, but they are not, that's not going to be sufficient. If you are going to orchestrate this well, enterprise mobility, then you are going to have to use some expert help. Okay? And we have a full-blown mobility business solutions division, as Kost just mentioned, uh, three big pillars. So let's start from the top, is that we don't want to just come in and say, okay, let's start developing application. It's about uh, discovery phase. We understand what your needs are, wh what do you have, where do you want to get, where are the deltas, propose a solution. We bring in our third-party uh, experts they are, uh, if you have specific systems. So if you are... SAP or BMC or Microsoft Shop, uh, we'll probably bring in some expert as well and we'll provide a joint solution. And then last but not the least, we are going to come uh, and have engineers code it for you. So we will develop, we'll deploy, uh, or we'll test, we'll deploy and manage for you to your specifications when it comes to security control and compliance. So this is about what's available right now. I have 10 minutes. I'm on time. So I'm, yeah, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing to remain on time. So let's uh, look at what's coming down the pike, OK? So this is what's in the cart right now. So I mentioned to you about the Go App Zone mobile application uh, studio or development platform. We have that available on-prem as of now. And what you are looking at right now, the first word is very important on demand or software as a service. So remember, Costas' second mandate was to build a dynamically scalable or scalable, globally scalable platform. And we wouldn't be able to scale if we just kept this goodness to on-prem and have our end customers use it. We wouldn't be able to scale well if we did not have this particular on-prem or Go App Zone uh, development uh, environment or platform and if we did not make it available for various different types of applications. Okay, so we, now with, with on-demand or SaaS, software as a service of Go Enterprise or Go uh, App Zone platform, we are going to enable lot and lot many more options. Let me walk you through a handful, okay, at this point. So I know this is pretty complex. Let's go step by step from left to right. And, okay, so it, this is the, remember I mentioned to you there are three sections. You develop the development environment that's sitting on your laptop. There's a server component. So this is your desktop or laptop that you download the de development environment. It's a small piece of software, point and shoot. You pick what you want, drag and drop, write a little bit of HTML5, you are done. Okay, so that's where it happens. You develop a small file that's the Go app file that's uh, our 
that's your application and mind you this one is very easy this this is to develop this one is very easy in order to make it easy this is where our patented technology comes into play so this has all the information all the necessary intelligence to develop cross platform application that you will be able to deploy on four different platforms you push it to the server now here's the the first way of expanding or increasing our reach to the next level is our test offering or go app zone test offering as this is as a service uh, idea is very simple you take this uh, file that you just developed right even a high school student can do it push it to the test server and using our go app zone uh, showtime that's a small application mm -hmm. that's available that you can download you start testing out what you just developed right so for example whether it is b2e application whether it is b2c you are going to find that you are going to have to reiterate you are going to deploy an app and see if it works right it, this is how you are going to find that this app is really usable you want to test out your app this is how you do it so think from a third party independent software developer okay they can use this cloud hosted hosted by us that way they do not have to install any servers and try out the best end user experience the best security the best workflow inside their app before they push it to apple app store before they deploy it within their enterprises let us look at the second workflow here where it says this is pay attention to this one stand alone applications so all along i've been talking about how we manage applications using our go enterprise server now here comes the next level of innovation these are stand alone applications that you develop an application that's not dependent on our server uh, we make this happen on demand and allow you to churn out four different versions so four different platforms and submit it to respective app stores okay so these are stand alone apps that get submitted by you these are not managed by go go enterprise server okay so this is uh, where is this useful okay for any third party independent software vendors for them this is heaven zero touch development multi platform or cross platform deployment right hosted by us so no headache at every single so uh, for development there is no headache for testing there is no headache for deployment there is no headache it has been taken out okay after this i would have to sit and code for you okay it it cannot get simpler than this one right and let's look at the last one okay so the, this deploy workflow this is we have taken the everything that we have right now and put it on the cloud for enterprises to use this churns out uh, supported applications or these are the managed applications the these apps can connect to cloud services whether it is a cnn's rss feed or it can connect to your in house erm and C, uh, crm and erp systems such as sap and what have you so now you again i'm iterating my reiterating myself uh, zero touch development cross platform deployment on demand so you don't have to go and do anything and connects to your existing infrastructure right it guys really if you understand the complexity it, it cannot get simpler okay this this is and we are going to make this available in q3 for public consumption right now it's limited or it's controlled availability we are working with uh, customers on one on one basis so that's the first piece let's look at what's happening yes yes please sorry to interrupt no. but i know that you are going to go crazy about that and so you just forgot it it's going to be offered for free it's free yes so we're expecting a whole community to start using the whole thing and actually build applications and once they're ready to deploy them then they will start paying paying up to that time they have to pay nothing for using the whole platform thank you thanks costas so again okay. so next one okay taking it to a whole new level is that there are still uh, use cases out there where at a high end where we wouldn't be able to satisfy the needs and get the po if we did not have the uh, magic of hey i would like to do something of my own okay so if that's the case we allow you to add uh, their hand coded code inside that if they are engineers developing 
uh, their stuff and they would like to have some custom touch uh, welcome. Okay, that's the first one. This one is the biggest of all, and I'm super excited. So understand, be with me here. Okay. Up till now, you heard about us developing standalone applications, us developing applications. Those are managed by our Go Enterprise server. What you're looking at here in, in this red item here is that going forward, our Go App Zone uh, MADP or application development platform will be able to secure applications. Those will be managed by our competitors, third party EMM vendors, other vendors. So where does it fit in, right? Why would we do something like this? Logic is very simple that we go into account or there are existing customers with existing enterprise mobility uh, MDMs pre-installed. They have, they are aligned with existing customer. We don't want to get in that way, right? If you want to go that route, that's fine. We will come in and mobilize your uh, internal workflow, mobilize your applications, and allow you to embed security control and compliance from third party. So you can have any logo here on this side, right, uh, uh, on there, anything, that's fine, any third party one, and we are okay with it. The whole idea here is to be able to mobilize your internal workflow, mobilize your uh, internal IT systems, and let any third party manage, securely manage this one. This opens up a whole new business for us with this one, okay? And last but not the least is, so everybody talks about, I want to develop an app for this guy, that guy, sales, marketing, what have you. If you understand, the risk profile of consumer is very different. CEO is different, the marketing uh, intern is very different in terms of the data, the type of apps they use, the type of data that they consume, and uh, amount of security that they, they will be subject to. So with this new uh, next level of MADP or our platform, we will be able to match the security we offer with the risk profile of the consumer. So for uh, healthcare and financial services, for banking guys, it's going to be FIPS certified, super secure libraries. For marketing intern, we do not want to have enterprises go through the excessive load on the server and have marketing in turn go through various different security parameters, it will be lax. So now you will be a slider scale, you know, you can choose the security level you need for uh, while deploying the application, okay? So these are the key ones, okay? And I'm going to quickly go through the rest of the items. I probably have less than a minute now. But the idea is very simple. We are going to add a layer of security by integrating with giants such as Cisco. Okay, work is underway. Uh, we are adding a whole new chapter in mobile security and risk management, uh, mobile collaboration and support. So basically with this one, if should anything go wrong with your, your phone, your application, your container, press a button and somebody will fix it. That's what it means, mobile security, uh, mobile collaboration and support, okay? And last but not the least, the biggest of all is if this is going to grow to 26 billion devices by 2020, then we want to be part of it. And all the things you just heard is all about being able to extend the platform and manage any parking meter, manage any internet controlled or enabled uh, refrigerator, your microwave and the pacemaker and what have you. Right? So internet of uh, things is going to be next in line and uh, mobile analytics, right? If you don't, mobile analytics is like compass. If you do not have a compass, probably worthless going anywhere. You wouldn't know where you're going. So eventually they'll have ample of data to use in order to make a business decision. So quick recap of what just happened in the last 30 minutes. It's like we have a strong offering in this space, okay? And we have a plan in place to maintain our lead and leapfrog our competitors. And second, our extend our platform for uh, emerging uh, requirements. Thank you very much. Over to Barry. <laughs> Sorry. I'll just, yeah. Sorry. Yes. Barry, this way. Okay. If there's a, if there's a question, yes. Yes, please. Can I ask a question quickly? It's something I'm slightly confused about. When you're developing applications for people, Thanks. When you're developing applications...
when you're developing applications for people. Can you just explain who owns the IP? Because I'm slightly confused. I think the impression was initially that you know you retain the IP, so the, you do work for these guys, and you develop some sort of you know travel app, as it were. But you retain the IP, and then you can sell that IP to other. You know, you can go off to to a. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of another travel, you know, my travel or whoever. I know it doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, you know, so, so just explain who owns the IP. No, answer is very simple. So we are not in the business of building IP on customer basis. Okay, what we have right now is, so let's demystify. For on-prem, customers and everything. For the on-demand, even, even then customer owns it. What you just heard that we have mobile banking, mobile travel, what have you, right? These are some of the samples that we have created. And then when customer comes along and say, that let, let us use your tools and your MBS division, it still resides with them. Okay, the IP is with them. Yeah, just to answer your question, there are two ways to handle that. First of all, um, for each and every customer, there is a specific demand that comes you know, within the project. And everything that is developed from zero to, you know, from ground up belongs to the customer. Our MBS division, our mobility business division, is actually investing in building IP on top of our platform that meets certain segments, like mobile banking. So it, it takes, say, a mobile banking application to an 80% functionality of what any bank would request. And then we can market it as our own IP. And then, yes, exactly. So. It's, it's, a, it's a mix and match situation, but what we own is actually what we have developed with our own resources and not on top of any customer project. Great. Thank you. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just uh, summarizing. Uh, you heard a lot of things today, and I think it's important to just walk away with what we think the key message is were, uh, but Custis and I talked and we thought that given my fiduciary responsibilities as chairman, it would be wrong for him to walk away with the headsets. Uh, <laughs> we, Demetrius said there's got to be a way that we can move this over into cost of marketing. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to give everybody one, yeah, <laughs> one more chance. We're going to have a, our own version of a death round here. Uh, and that is, in the summary of the key points to take away from this presentation, Custis picked what he thought was the one point that was most important. And so these headsets will go to whoever can call that out first. And before you do, we wanted to make it even easier. And so we, if you put to, uh, on the slide, we made it a multiple choice. Test, if you can just put this on, uh, one choice is, well, all the four choices are here. So whoever can call out the, all the answers are good, by the way. There are no, <laughs> there, there are no bad choices, but only one matches the right answer here, which is what Custis believed was most important. So. Good answer. I, I can't hear. You need. Stand up. Just to prove. <laughs> Just to prove it wasn't fixed. We had the answer written down at the beginning. So uh, I, I listed seven things that I think uh, you could walk away with. One is that our total capabilities uh, are unique. You know, having uh, mobile device management, a complete enterprise mobility management, mobile uh, application development platform, and a services capability really does make us unique in the market. That uh, technology is proven. Uh, you saw that in the discussion with some of our customers and partners today and how the uh, products are being used and how they're being 
uh, chosen. Uh, the products are scalable. Uh, the size of the applications we've been talking about are big. What we see in our own pipeline is the uh, opportunities are becoming larger for us. Uh, we've proven the business model because we've used it to grow and to grow profitably and to expand our business. And now we're moving forward with our business model, adding direct sales, but I think in a very well thought out, controlled way. So we feel comfortable with the business model. Uh, fifth, we've been recognized by some very key uh, influencers in the marketplace, such as IDC and Gartner. And that's created a lot of interest and pull in the marketplace for Globo, which we haven't had in the past. When you're making a very big purchase and you have to start looking at, who should I be looking at? And you start seeing, well, what does IDC say? What, excuse me, what does Gartner say? That gives you the list of, sh the short list of people you want to talk to. And now Globo is very much a part of that list. Uh, six is that we've uh, uh, achieved significant market reach, geographically, uh, vertically, and in the size of application. And finally, uh, as a company, we are committed to and are also capable of delivering a continued market growth uh, continued revenue growth, continued profit growth, and continued growth of both the products and services that we offer. So with that, I would thank you for coming and uh, enjoy the football tonight. Thanks. <laughs>